Constant, Major Total, Rachel Dabcher for my interest, my normal companies are picking up on that. And you understand about the volume, you saw the chat at the bottom of the page. You can see it's all the way to the master plan. I'm going to ask you about the plan. Și mulțumesc gazdelor noastre de invitație. Ne avem alături pe colegii din scena independentă și o să facem o mică spatele despre practicile lor și teatrale care sunt următoare de comunități. Am pregătit o serie de întrebări, dar nu te vreau să vă prezentați voi scurtul, ca să fiți afiniați de iniciativele cu izbațiilor pe care le reprezentați. Și după aceea, o să fiu de timp scurt, dar nu știți mai încep în tine. Sunt Enica Gheorghevă și reprezint aici Asociația de Antipalul Șoșii. Silviu Ruști și reprezint Teatrul Magic Pate. Rău ca bună, la Create Act Enjoy. Eu sunt Rău Dalos și sunt de la Reactor. Imeși Mărtoleanu, mă numesc de la Asociația Vărătăr în Proiect. Lucrăm și noi aici. Vă așa să-mi țin la Proiect. Toți care vizionați și prezența astăzi, sunt acolo și spații în care ne vorbim acolo. Dar oricum crează într-o bine, dar avem spații de vizibil de post, în care ne aflăm de ea spune aici. În acest ocupări de lucruri, era tocmai să iasă din acest spațiu și să întâlnească exerce comunități și proiecturi, care le iubiază, care se întâmplă atât în mediul rural, sau în orașul mai mic, sau în struri de adecitale, proiecturi educaționale pentru copii. Deci avem o bună varietate de activități și aș vrea să trebuie la care activități care ne-am luat în acest spațiu și ne-am luat în acest formare de comunități. So the first question, there are two microphones. Did motivate you to start this kind of activity, which is focused on the special focus on communities, not necessarily on activities of the center of life. Inocentul-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural-Cultural
pay the tickets for the movie. Și o scură plus de hrănit, adică nu poți să fac doar de drag de a face asta, așa că am început să scriem proiecte și să facem și un mare mare fond de volum, să nu fost astfel încât dacă mergem, nu știu, jucăm două spectacole, eu am cine în ceea ce să ne susținem, ok, putem să jucăm și trei, dar nu știu, asta să ne Și atunci am început să mergem în diferite spații unde lumea, practic, nu mergea niciodată. Și toate legate de chestia asta, faptul că copiii nu știau, dar unii n-au mai văzut niciodată spectacole. Așa că, înainte de spectacole, avem și o show de introducere, vorbeam ce înseamnă teatru, ce înseamnă ceea ce la păbușar sau actor și ce face ei, cum am făcut. Erau scurte exerciții pe care le am venit ca jurnalist pe o și deja am obișnuit cu ideea de comunități, pentru că am lucrat destul de mult la un site de cinema și m-am putut așa la observare de țară, din propria mea inițiativă, pur și simplu am vrut să văd dacă în afara titlului se întâmplă cam la fel și pe sau nu. Și atunci am mers și la media și că era festival de film, am mers și la televizoare, că era festival de film din multe la mine care sunt foarte acum și mă întotdeauna. Că încă nu chiar și cu aia în sală. Poate ne zice dacă în sfârșit se deschide sau nu, dar nu se deschide. Și deschis? Tot anul? Iar. Super ce echipă. Wow! Și e minunat. Așa, și la multe altele, și am descoperit comunitățile astea pentru care, așa cum tu ce ai de teatru, că e ceva nou, filmul era ceva nou, nu aveau ce ei de să viață, și am descoperit la care era ascultă oamenilor la ceva care nu era atunci de foarte obișnuit, dar care pentru ei e ceva care pare poate dată în an, sau nici măcar atunci, și doar la fac o excursie în așa mare. Și cumva deja aveam ideea asta în cap, că ar trebui să facem și în altă parte decât la Cruș să se întâmple lucrurile, pentru că de altfel de aici sunt curioși câte lume chiar s-a născut la Cluj. Dacă e cineva care chiar s-a născut la Cluj, se ridice o mână scurt dintre noi. Destul de mult, dar totuși sunteți o minoritate. Deci, mă știu, marea parte suntem vinituri și cumva cred că ne rămâne gândul ăsta să să facem ceva și pentru locurile alea din care am plecat și în care am avut noroc să ajungem mai aici, dar nu am avut plecat. Așa că la Creative Cleaver am început ca voluntar de pe Spostinger, etc. pe Cleaver, care se întâmpla în spitale. Și asta era în 2015 și am cumva tot urcat în atribuții până când am ajuns să trăimiesc pe voluntar. Și... Volunteers. Și, practic, our project is some kind of a therapy project through art to which uh, people, especially people from the villages, do not have access at all. Um, in hospitals they are somehow, you know, held or captive for a while and then they are able to see a, a, a classical music concert or a handmade workshop or a theatrical performance. They wouldn't do that at home, but as long as they are in hospital they don't really have any other option to spend the free time and meet other people and socializing. This is how they are curious. They became curious and that, that is how something new opens their their uh, their interest. Their interest is open toward things that maybe were completely unavailable for them before. So annually about ten five to ten thousand people have access to our to our activities. We went to Vulcha uh, region or Alba Iulia, other places. We had workshop activities with a couple of people who came from other places and uh, we went in the uh, hospital rooms, all kinds of improvisation performances or something they themselves could do and 
Thus, I think uh, we reached an audience of, of about 10,000 people, I think, so that they uh, came to understand certain segments of culture that, that was not familiar uh, to them before, had not been familiar. And then people uh, remain attached to us and they ask questions and now they are waiting us back and in wheelchair and in other places they want to know when we go back. It's really uh, a motivation. This uh, thing by itself is a motivation, motivation that uh, people got attached to our projects. They are asking us when we return and it's not so easy because we need to do projects and get funding for those and so on and so forth. Are there other motives, other motivations or other things? Yes, <laughs> they come and go, disappear. All kinds of motivations are there and disappointment sometimes also. I think that we are still here. The fact that we are still here means that the motivation is stronger than, uh, the, than the part that draws us down or back. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say that uh, I was in a hospital with my mom at the orthopedic. He, she had undergone orthopedic surgeries and suddenly this was in Alba Julia and your colleagues appeared in the hospital and it was a very nice surprise for me to see your friends there. Doru. Uh, as long as my colleagues talked, I tried to put some order in my head. Um, in 2013, Together with Anna Madare, I was returning from Barcelona. Uh, we had some money and we knew that we have about 18 months of uh, being unemployed and we have we had the plans for, for 18 months and we needed to find a place and then uh, to find people, a community of artists perhaps, who could give uh, life to that very a uh, very poor place in fact it's a it's a it's a it's a poor uh, location and uh, we invited a lot of artists to Cluj to see the space uh, in question to meet the uh, the public a public that that uh, later on became a very important community for us but then first of all the community of artists from around the space they invested their energy and it, it has done uh, it has been done voluntarily they uh, uh, really came with their time and energy we started with productions of a, of a very low budget like uh, for even 30 lei or 1000 lei very small uh, honorariums uh, were paid like 30 lei or 50 lei for a show and later on when the projects uh, got interconnected and we obtained some funding we in, uh, put some more effort into it and then tomorrow, for instance, we are going to have the show, uh, uh, the first show of a, of a performance in which 30 artists had been working for almost nine months with a lot of music. And when we have such a performance, uh, putting, putting such a performance on stage, we are not only thinking of Cluj, of course, or around the audience of our own but uh, we always consider or try to think of how the audience can be enlarged communities from other towns for instance how we could mean the idea came somehow uh, maybe from an egoist point of view that uh, we wanted to show ourselves but later on uh, we seeked we, we sought uh, small communities in the vicinity of Cluj which don't have a theater and during the pandemic years we wanted to go out of the room uh, so we wanted to see if we can see the, the the audience in other towns and we repeated that later on it's called mini reactor we have put on stage about three or four various performances that can be played outside uh, in the community of artists and also the public, uh, it's it's a common investment of, of these two. We had all kinds of community events to which more than 90 people came. There's a lot of work. Uh, and if you do not succeed to reach an audience or a public, then 
it makes no sense to do it. So that that is why it is important to maintain a dialogue with these uh, audiences to construct, in a way, an audience uh, among the people who are interested in our activity, also in the towns. I don't think it's enough to go with one show to a community, but we, you need to return. And when you go there in the 10th time or the 15th time or the 20th time, then uh, the audience starts to build. I think that's all for the moment. Yes, our project started 13 years ago to create productions. Yeah. In the second year, we already had a show for children, and I would like to talk first of all about these educational theatre project. Our project is entitled On Four Wheels, and we already had two editions of that, and we succeeded to take these performances in various localities in Transylvania, in various towns and uh, villages where a significant Hungarian language community uh, exists and where there are not really uh, cultural institutions present, like a theatre or something. The motivation was to implement this pro project in order to make these performances available for the children. And in the faculty, in, in, at the university, we already met that kind of uh, uh, things and and what we, we studied about that and, and we wanted to put that into practice, what we have learned at the university. Uh, we organized a, a performance which was entitled Freckles uh, Getting Out of Control or uh, and these performances were successful. Maybe we did not think right from the beginning and uh, these these shows practically are can be taken very easily with a car because everything that we need can fit into two suitcases and this is how we succeeded to uh, uh, reach a more and more diverse public. We remember that uh, where exactly the village, I don't remember the name, we went in the kindergarten, there were about 30 children and about 10 people out, ten, 10 more children outside uh, in, in the kitchen. And we asked, what are they doing there? And they said, well, they could not afford to buy the ticket. And we said, it doesn't matter. They, they can join as well. And then we succeeded to obtain funding uh, from various sources. And then we made projects in order to address this issue. Uh, sometimes if the school said that they can help us with a certain amount of money, then we accepted that. The motivation presently, I wouldn't really like to talk about the motivation right now. Yes, it's a... Uh, we all work in independent theater and it is very important f uh, for us uh, to identify the motivations. We don't have institutions to support us, behind us, and the personal, uh, uh, personal situation of our cooperators doesn't always permit to go on with the project and then in that case the project suffers. For instance, we are in a situation in which uh, all of us started to have families, uh, other, we entered into a different stage in our lives and this makes the projects suffer a little bit. So we don't know what our future will look like. But right now we have a couple of projects that are still running. We perform one here, for instance. I am optimistic, but maybe a, a break or a, 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 a pause of one year will will not do harm to anyone i uh, don't have a problem with the language but with my uh, feelings yes 
So whatever Levy has just said. For instance, the Shoshin has been founded by Kyolo Chongora and myself, and we make up a family. And when our children were born, everything changed. So is it fair to talk about such things in a roundtable discussion? Yeah, I guess it is, because everything has changed. I need to stay at home, or my husband needs to stay at home, and things change altogether. So the Shoshin was uh, founded eight years ago, and we took the break. Uh, Levi uh, wants to make good use of, well, we had this break last year, and I guess that our men that the people's mental and physical uh, status is very important because at some point you don't really know uh, I mean I don't really know why I should stay up until 2 a.m. to organize something and to pay somebody to take care of my children so it's very important to maintain this uh, what I call joy factor because uh, you still feel that you also get something of whatever you are doing for Shoshin, I guess that the key moment was when we got connected or when we saw how people got connected. The, our work is not uh, really based on productions. We have had only a couple of them so far, but we worked a lot on the pedagogical line, and I will tell you why. And we have also been working with village people, village communities, uh, street theater, um, and with lots of people. And we have always been searching how it is possible co to connect in a team or how you can connect with the public, which bears a certain value. So I have certain experiences from the classical theater uh, where I play on the stage and I have no idea what happens with the public and the public has no idea whatever happens with me actually. And I guess that this is a problem. And we have been trying to search situations which make it possible for us to connect. So for me, this day is such a day to connect. Although it is not theater, it is a like theater, because I can look into your eyes, I can look into the eyes of the people in the public, and I guess that we can uh, bond. I guess that uh, the uh, key issue is why do we need this? Well, we have realized that we wanted to use practices which are not really known here in our country. So there used to be people involved in such activities, but not in Romania. And then we got into touch with uh, people uh, there on the international stage of pedagogy, and we organized lots of workshops. And after that, we realized that uh, basically the artists uh, for whom we invited these people wouldn't come. And we were trying hard to create sort of an environment for learning, but nobody's interested in learning. And then we said, OK, let's drop it. I don't want to uh, prolong it. I will still have opportunities to tell you things about ourselves. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I met Chongora and Anike one year ago when they said that they would like to have a break. Well, I guess that now you deserve another one because this event has also been organized by yourselves. Yeah, we have the living proof here. You mentioned the type of activity and then my next question is connected to this. I would be curious to know how you choose your, your site of work and the second one is how do you define your activities? Where do you see them? Is it a cultural intervention or participative uh, culture? Or uh, 
setting up performances, organizing performances, uh, run in other spaces or, or what? Well, actually our main purpose has been production and performances. And after a couple of performances, mostly for children, well, we also had a performance for youngsters and that uh, production was written in the 18th century in the Hungarian literature. Uh, it's a piece of literature that is mandatory in high school. It has an archaic language, therefore nobody reads it. It's called sort of a national drama, so it's very highly ranked. And we were trying to use an adapted text and we set up a performance that is being shown in schools. So we did this in 2013 and we had over uh, 200 uh, performances. We went also to Hungary, but performances were mostly here in Transylvania and we had a large success. It is great to be part of this uh, production. So whenever we play this piece, well, the sun comes out. I cannot say that this is educational theater. It has interactive and participatory part. <coughs> but it's mostly the storyline that is based on. And how have you chosen the places you went to? Well, basically, we play in <coughs> Cluj in each and every Hungarian high school. Uh, we have a piece of luggage, and our production fits into it perfectly, all of it. So we started. We started to call the high schools, uh, telling them we, that we would like to go. But after a while, uh, it was the high schools who called us, inviting us over there. And after that performance, we started to get interested in educational theater, which in Romania is not very well known, but it already has a very rich history in Hungary, history of over 25 years. So we got into contact with a um, uh, round table uh, theater, it's called like that, from Hungary. They uh, have been involved in educational theater and uh, they uh, have been in contact with the forefathers in the UK. So we organized workshops with them. We even had a co-production with them. It wasn't a pure cut, uh, clear cut co-production because the pandemic came. So they set up a performance. We had another one. So not a classical co-production anyway. So yes, educational theater, this is how I would define our activity. As for the location, as for the site, uh, so that four-wheeled event I was talking to you about, well, uh, it's very important to have a Hungarian language community without direct access to Hungarian culture. And this is how we started to visit uh, different places, localities, first of all, small towns, well, not necessarily small ones, because we went to Brasov and to Bayamar as well. It happened quite often that uh, once we were in Brasov, we visited the neighborhood as well. And we had a bizarre story. We were playing in one of the small towns in the vicinity of Brasov. And uh, we were looking forward to meet a high school team, but they couldn't come because they were short of gasoline, so we suddenly decided that we would go over there and have the show. So as for the second edition of this four-wheel project uh, took place during the pandemic, and it was very difficult for us to organize uh, shows because the schools didn't accept us. And uh, my wife, by the way, family, my wife, thought of calling the orphanages and uh, 
We did. So that's why, um, that's how we came to visit lots of uh, orphanages in very many places, uh, of about eight altogether. And that was, again, an awesome experience. Uh, we also went twice to uh, a locality uh, close to Cluj. There, so it was it. It wasn't actually us choosing the place; it was the place choosing us. So, who would like to go on? Well, I don't know where the reactor or mini reactor projects would fit in. I guess that we are directed towards processes because all of our projects have long-term mm, stakes, so a lot of them things at stake. So we are oriented towards project investigating our histories, and for the next five years, we would like to talk about the future. And together with my colleagues, we would like to see how we can approach this future as a subject matter and how we could add something to it, how we could enrich it, and how we could reach out to the public. So we are trying to uh, set up workshops, professional artistic workshops for our team, but also management and cultural management uh, courses. As for the community building, we are organizing dialogues with the public, organizing workshops, theater workshops even. And we also have cultural uh, interventions in the public space and in other communities as well. And I guess that this uh, cultural intervention is very appropriate because we are not going only once. We are attempting to have several meetings with the same people. Uh, Zalo. Zalo is a town very close to Cluj, so ac actually it is one hour drive to Cluj. Uh, you can go there, uh, it's enough to have one day. Of course we have a contact, contact to get us into touch with the authorities, with the town halls, uh, and so on and so forth. So we tried that in Bistrica and other towns as well in Transylvania, so we've been groping around, so to say. So the dialogue with the authorities can be very complicated sometimes, as you know. But the most important thing is that we do exist and that Zalo doesn't have a theater. And OK, I'm a bit lost right now. It's nevertheless true that the Zalo is close. And at the first sight, it seemed something very simple. But in order to organize a performance, you may have to be there 10 times before you can actually uh, show the people your production. It is apparently simple. You go to Zalo and you play. But Sunday morning, 6 AM, you wake up and you need to build some efficiency around your performances because maybe once you have to play for the adults and then you have to do it for the uh, children. Yeah, so it's very complicated. And now we are trying to see what we can actually do in order to reduce certain risks. So to avoid overlapping uh, performances, nem tudom hány óra van, mert nem néztem meg, majd visítsál jó, ha lejárt a 20-25 percet. So we are trying to before the pandemic, we were attempting to do seven performances a year. Well, now we are happy if we do four. So there's a lot of work. And we have a place in Cluj. We would like to go to other places. You want to keep yourself in the process, to be involved in the process. So it's very complicated. 
people in independent area are doing lots of uh, similar things. I am here today, tomorrow I will have to go to my team and to sort out some banking and, and cash flow issues. So it is always good to have new people showing up uh, with other targets, other towns to target. So in Cluj and around of Cluj. Oh, you have to resettle the dynamic. I don't know if my generation is ready to start. So we are taking a break with Zalo right now. Of course, if somebody invites us uh, to take a performance to Zalo, we, we do that. But actually, it is everything is complicated, and this summer with Mini Reactor, we organized a summer camp where we uh, joined together with children from different communities. This was a project that seemed very easy and beautiful. But in practice, when you have to organize a summer camp, there's a lot of bureaucracy to deal with. And especially the fact that children come from different environments, this adds uh, another, another, another kind of uh, risk and other complications. Yes. So the texts how do you how do you choose with the text or the scenes situations intervention cultural production participative or interactive now i was thinking to start with the texts because they have somehow connected to the question in the sense that when we established before establishing the theater, someone came to us, to Florin and me, and uh, he proposed to dramatize Chipike, Chipi uh, from Fodor Sandor, the, the, the giant dwarf. And I said, why not? And that was practically the beginning of Magic Puppet. And uh, then we said we should go out and play in communities. And then we realized that people like it, and they uh, asked us to come a second time and then we were thinking of uh, changing uh, some things to see what kind of the problems uh, we have seen. The first problem was uh, uh, superheroes are a great fashionable thing. And in the meantime, children uh, learn not to beat with each other or not to fight with each other. And then there are the superheroes which fight all the time. So we tried to write our own uh, texts using puppets um, like Cluj type of puppets which are kept like this I'm showing with my hand and then puppets that are kept in a different way and let, let's make a magic performance or a marionette uh, or uh, soap balloons and di uh, diversify the show because the children who uh, were our audience practice needed new things to see so in vain I come with classical types of shows. We make it. We have to make it more diverse, in order to permit in in order to permit them to get access to all kinds of new things. Sometimes we are even perhaps too exaggeratedly interactive. Uh, the, even even in, uh, the public can even detour uh, the entire show. We introduce new characters. We take out characters, and so on. And then we improvised quite a lot. This means a lot of improvisation. And our shows, in that sense, are very diverse, very different. The same performance one year ago is completely one year ago was completely different than what we do today. We play quite a lot. We have uh, uh, thousands of shows uh, that are running actively. We have four teams, and we were playing. I think uh, the, the most was uh, 12 shows in a day with Magic Puppet, so... And yes, 
for us. Absolutely, financial things are absolutely important for us as well, but uh, still we succeeded to uh, put the accent on quantity to reach as many children as possible. We play quite a lot, our performances are taken, are bought, like for instance the magic show of Florin is, has been going on for uh, uh, many years and he I think has got five or ten shows every weekend. Uh, what I what I was going to say or what I want to say is that we play quite a lot and things change they are interactive and we adapt ourselves and uh, the show to the children uh, in order to make it uh, the artistic part to make it more accessible or to transmit the message more clearly or uh, if we have something that clear edu uh, educational purpose we would like to see how uh, the message can get through to the children who are our audience uh, and the spaces the, the places where you perform how do you choose them well <clears throat> just like my colleagues uh, told had told before it depends on it is uh, depending on the distance as well how you can reach uh, in the morning uh, how, uh, maybe you get up at five o'clock in the morning and I can return to Cluj in the evening. So the, the, f the farthest distance we succeeded to reach was Oradea. And by three o'clock we uh, returned to Cluj to do the dishes at home. So um, it was really very tiring indeed. But later on we uh, became better known by the people and they are uh, they, we started to be invited and then we had to extend ourselves and then we, we discovered that there's not much to do in the summer and then we ca came up with new ideas. Uh, we uh, participated in various festivals in Untold, in Never See, and then going into shopping malls in during the summer or street shows so that uh, uh, all these occasions help us maintain our shows. And this is how we succeeded. How we succeed to extend all over Romania, from Botoshan to Constanza and Arad. And uh, uh, a month ago, we've been we've been to Alexandria, for instance. So we have practically covered the entire territory of Romania. We think that uh, Florin I Florin and I think that we are not really good in advertising ourselves, and people come to us, but uh, in order. In, when, when we organize uh, ourselves, pe people maybe don't know about us that much. And we are trying to find the resources and the people to help us in that respect. But uh, in the meantime, uh, telephone rings all the time and we have got events all the time. So somehow people find us uh, anyway. And, uh, and then it is hard to organize all these resources and the cars logistic problems uh, to reach each and every location and the artists last year as i have mentioned the two directions theater for children and the educational part and we are uh, and how we are trying to combine these two or complete them uh, and do street performances for instance last year for instance uh, it was the pandemic and it was a moment of break and uh, we said to ourselves that it would be good to uh, create some shows for the adults, for the adult audience. And uh, we last year succeeded to organize four such shows for adult audiences. And we started to write projects to obtain some funding from the town hall and to extend ourselves, expand our activity in that area. I think uh, puppeteering is not only for children, and this is really a work that uh, is hard and we need to carry that out. And But I think this is our direction. So we were playing in the morning for children, like children at the Patarut, at the, at the garbage dump of, Cla of Cluj, and in the afternoon with a completely different audience. So the situation was really completely different. And where is our target? We, because we can't really be available for everyone. And then we need to select somehow. And then we we said we are doing puppeteering, puppet, puppet theater with all 
which is a, uh, which is good for each and every child, irrespective of the language. Uh, sometimes we improvised in English, then I started to speak Romanian, and they were all strangers, and then uh, they asked, I asked them, well, do you understand Romanian? And the audience said no, and then I started with English. And it worked. It was very interesting. It was an interesting issue. And on the side of uh, adult performances, or performances oriented to adult, uh, we try to make shows that can be played in various places, in other places. Right now, we only can we we can only do it in our own room, in our own hall, uh, uh, on our own stage. But we want to diversify, diversify that. Okay. <laughs> uh, look, uh, it was very interesting to hear it, and. Uh, but then uh, you should say, and then uh, Raluca hasn't answered this question either, so... Uh, yeah. We choose our places of performance depending on our possibilities and the needs. The whose needs? Your needs or the audience? No. Uh, our possibilities and the needs of the communities we are trying to address, of course. So, I think... Um, where do we work? Uh, it, it greatly depends on our relationships with, uh, well, this, let's say so, uh, with international relations. Chongor worked quite a lot, uh, I went, went to many workshops, and me too, and we made contacts with people with whom, uh, 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 with whom we made great uh, relationships, and uh, we really liked and enjoyed what kind of practices they use or how they approach the whole issue. And I think the associ uh, our association, Shoshin, is very, uh, very much influenced by these practices. Let me give you a, a concrete example. We had a workshop or a residence three, four years consecutively. And in these four years, some kind of a cultural barter was introduced. Chongor saw something at Odin, at Odin Week, and he liked it very much, and we tried to implement it here. And there are many different practices like that. We felt that um, it's good to try to carry out those things at home and experiment with, with those things. And we think that we never uh, tried to uh, have a show in which we impose ourselves or we don't have to want to have a competition with anyone because we know that we cannot really compete as an organization we are too small to compete with with uh, greater we managed to hire or we managed to rent out this place which looked terrible uh, but with some colleagues from various places like even uh, colleagues from the patar it's non-functional for us because we don't have uh, right now, we don't have any kind of uh, performances here. About a year, uh, a year and a half ago, the Varotel and the waiting room came in and they used this, this space. But we are very proud that uh, we are very proud that we have this with this space. We don't have our own productions, but still, we used uh, uh, these activities and. Uh, we were in, we were involved in various European projects. Uh, there are villages in which we work, five, six, seven villages around Cluj. And I think we will talk more about that in the afternoon. Maybe, maybe you can say a few words about the villages, how they were chosen, uh, based on the distance, Efficiency and uh, logistical issues are very important. We try to identify a person with whom we can have a good connection, a reliable person. A reliable person with whom we can work together. And uh, there was another there was another issue. We tried to find at least one village where shows could be 
carried out in Romania, not only in Hungarian, because we did not really want to uh, close ourselves into the Hungarian uh, me, uh, uh, audience only. And so therefore we chose a village where Romanian is spoken. Our experiences are very connected, are interconnected, and a lot of ideas came into my mind as I was listening to my colleagues. And uh, we all practically went through all those stages that you have mentioned. In the beginning, in 2011, when they <coughs> started and when I was in, uh, in the team myself as a friend and could really see their uh, problems and, and the, uh, the, thing, the, the, the difficulties they had to face. And they wanted to create something of their own. And this is art therapy uh, started in the, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the hospitals in Cluj. <coughs> because a door was open for us there and we stayed there and we have been there ever since and after that first episode the first project uh, the association was born and the members of the founding member uh, the founding members wanted to establish an independent theater and film company <clears throat> that was the initial slogan it took quite a lot of time to achieve that and it also meant that there there was a space uh, that was needed you were uh, somehow connected to a, to a black box <clears throat> that was a uh, uh, that was a really hard job to find and identified many locations were changed it was very complicated to pay the rent for such a space and get uh, get the necessary funds to maintain the places we did not really have many uh, performances that that generated incomes and then we were focusing on identity and uh, uh, we know how all these things changed. Uh, the children uh, got on the stage for at Urania, for instance, and for a long time it was, uh, 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 the accent was, was, uh, was placed or emphasis on theatre because we had uh, more collabor collaborator actors and uh, dramat uh, dramaturgy uh, experts and in addition to our vital project projects that that was to which we try to focus and then things have changed and we uh, we told ourselves we have to go back to the essence we have to find unconventional uh, uh, places why should we uh, why should we link ourselves very much or anchor ourselves to a space. So we should go out to the community and find the places there, find the, the suitable uh, spots where these in cultural interventions or participative art uh, projects can be carried out. And in the last two years uh, is the, the House of Tales, for instance, and all these houses could turn into some kind of memorial houses but we want to ter uh, transform them into playgrounds. There are shows that are going on, installations, artistic installations, special music going on there, in addition to the theatrical performances. Uh, all projects in which uh, you somehow get, in, get uh, closer to the personality who stayed in that house, for instance. Doina Kornia's house, then at... Uh, on Rakovica Street or Sigismund Toduca Street, we have got such, uh, we have got six such houses already in our portfolio. And what I like very much is uh, this issue of going out to a place which belongs to everyone, but somehow not everyone has access. And then we can, you know, uh, revendicate or take it for ourselves, occupy it. It can be a cultural center in Borsha or the house where Doina Kornia used to live, but it belongs, it, 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 it somehow uh, gets, uh, we succeed to obtain it for the, the, the whole community. And in, in that sense, it also helps us uh, in, in, uh, with our financial issues. And we renovated these, these spaces, we painted them and it was a hard thing to do and uh, 
now we identified as a as a community art organization and that's what we are focusing right now and that's that's the path we are following thank you very much well you know that the microphones are available for the audience as well if you if uh, some of you would like to ask questions uh, to the participants here i have one more question left but then i'm relying on you if you have questions i would be interested very much to hear a little bit about your relationships between uh, a, a relationship with with people or communities that are not privileged and as levy has said they would like to return and there are some connections that have been made they would like to return to such communities like some kind of recurrent uh, meetings it is important to see from the connections that you make how how many of those connections are kept or remain and can be used in the future and um, of, uh, now not everyone has to but if you have got something to say about that I would be really interested to hear them and you can talk about the effects of your work and how and maybe you can talk about the impact with your own terms and in, in your own words what you feel like an impact regarding connections and relationships yes the idea is to maintain all these relationships keep them alive but uh, we know from all kinds of relationships we have in life relationships with friends maybe you want to keep or maintain relationships with everyone uh, with whom you were friends in high school for instance and but life goes on and then you don't have the energy and at one point you don't communicate that much uh, with them anymore and it's a similar thing there are certain contacts needed uh, which are benefic for maintaining the relationships and in if we are really wanted at certain place we are invited again and if we also obtain funding for that then the re then the relationship will exist or will thrive or will go on but if some of those aspects are not available it's not always easy for instance when we went uh, to Vulcha uh, with art therapy we used actors there trying to uh, trying to create an, a, a community of artists there so that they can overtake the projects later on but nobody really wanted to overtake the organizational part and there's a lot of work involved in that the, I, I could see that that put some kind of a keyword uh, well the difficult part of the of the hard work was n not really uh, something very popular to be overtaken so or taken over so um, there are places to which we cannot physically return anymore because it's just not possible and there are places where we really want to go back the transfer the transfer is a difficult thing and the second question what was yes it was related to the impact the issue of impact in the community with your own words we do it very classically we uh, uh, we, uh, we have questionnaires and we work uh, with collaborators who know how to design a questionnaire know how to ask the questions the right questions and so on and they can do it really scientific in a scientific uh, way with, with uh, we have colla collaborators from the psychology faculty from the education uh, program of the university and from that we try to draw conclusions uh, that can help us improve what we are doing and we try to gather the data from the people themselves qualitatively rather than quantitative quantitatively I assume well both in fact because with the hospitals uh, there are really a lot of quest questionnaires that are distributed like uh, many are collected uh, the, the 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 hospital we are working uh, the rehabilitation hospital in Cluj has got seven floors so we have got quite a lot of people involved and many questionnaires
you have to go back to a community several times. I guess that we all know this. So we organized this uh, residence programs in Kira where we set up a space for this. Actually, it was a one week workshop where we invited people from different places in order to act as trainers and it was always the village people who were invited. It was public, of course, where people from the village came and after three or four years only, we started hearing that they miss us, they are missing us, they are waiting for us and they would like for the event to take place again. Well, quite unfortunately, we couldn't go back to Kida. Uh, we went back to another one. Actually, it was two. And I don't think that it was good for us to, to make the switch, but we were forced to. Anyway, we could see how uh, relationships uh, between and among people are being built between ourselves and the community and uh, that's why I say that we unfortunately had to give up on on that project sometimes we meet people we used to work with and we tell them that we had a couple of successes by using this and that. And actually, uh, this is what we can call impact. So we do not have a public saying us, oh, what a beautiful performance you've had. Uh, we meet several people we uh, work with and each of these people take something with themselves. And I guess that this is why it is worthwhile for us doing it. Yes. I remember that at some point you worked with pensioners and you set up a, a production with them. Yes, it was the Mera project. So it wasn't only pensioners. It was all age groups, including pensioners, but there were also children and we had a community performance inspired by the myths living in the locality and inspired by the stories of the people there. And that is why the whole performance was very touching and personal for them. And it, they took it very personally. Actually, it was because they went to see a performance in which it was their neighbor uh, acting on the stage or playing on the stage. And the public, the people in the public could see their own neighbor from another angle, from another point of view. And actually everybody heard their own stories, but the story, might have been told by the perspective of another person. So I guess that that performance was played twice, if I'm not wrong. No, in Mera. Yeah, we had one with Mera, with the pensioners, and one at the transit house in Cluj. Uh, did you have a different type of work in Mera than the same performance uh, in, in Cluj? Well, I couldn't work with the pensioners because I had to babysit my children. And that was... <coughs> we had a, a project. We loved... We had partners from the UK and from Germany. And we would have liked to put up a small show with pensioners from Cluj. And 
it was either myself or Chongor entering this project, this atypia project, because one of us had to babysit our children at home. Yeah, it's very difficult to <coughs> assess the impact in these places. <coughs> because we have different kinds of financing but you need a uh, very deep strategic thinking you have to prioritize yes and you have to include everything yes it takes a lot of work a lot of effort So uh, what I would like to underline as a result is that as compared to the first uh, tours, after that it was a lot easier to organize the performances because um, we've already had our contacts, we've already had our key persons. At first, uh, we had to call this person six times and introduce ourselves, and after a while, they, they knew who we were. And this is a very important impact, but what is nevertheless more important is that, is that the quality that you have already mentioned, the impact of the performances, the direct impact on the children only a couple of examples. We played in, in Budapest, which is totally different from our projects, but we played in a sports uh, high school where they train future world champions. And before us starting, the literature teacher came to us and she told us, these kids are dumb, they don't read. I'm sorry, I must apologize. And I need to say that the performance was great. It was everything was alive. And we felt that although the children uh, live in Budapest, uh, they have never been to the theater. And especially because they don't read, the whole performance was more alive. And we've had uh, several such examples in vocational schools, different kinds of profiles. Uh, waders and uh, bricklayers. Uh, we were always uh, very uh, anxious before the performances, but the performances, uh, the performances came out great. Uh, these are not long-term uh, projects. Um, we would like to have long-term projects to go back to talk to these young people time and again. But even the carpe diem was something, uh, something awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any questions in the room? Hello there. You talked a bit about the uh, impact of the pandemic. But uh, how has the behavior of the public, how has it changed after the pandemic? And how has your team changed after the pandemic? And I'm also curious <coughs> to know whether you have any intention of, of dealing with the uh, digital environment. Some of you did have digital uh, presence during the pandemic. So what is the uh, participation of the public? I can feel that participation of the public has changed greatly, but I would like to uh, hear you as well. Well, from the point of view of the events, I can tell you that this year we've had more events than ever. If before the pandemic, we had a team of 10 plus people and seven or eight collaborators. Once life became free again, uh, well, uh, we, we at some point drew the line 
and we realized uh, we have realized that it's 10 of us in the basic team but uh, we've had 45 collaborators and a lot more events and i'm telling you this because there have been lots of events uh, because we have been called invited and uh, where we met a lot of people at the theater in the theater hall for instance well i cannot give you any f figures because uh, we opened sh before the pandemic and uh, closed and then we have opened only a couple of months ago so i cannot really talk about the public or our public uh, it happened once that we only had two people in the public and we had to cancel the show so um, if the world knows you uh, actually we used to be known by managers uh, but not the public and if theater or festival managers knew us they invited us but the people didn't come because the people didn't know us so uh, it's been very difficult for us to promote ourselves as for the virtual digital environment it's kind of a disappointment for us because once with the pandemic we had over 50 online events that is at the very beginning there was a lot we kept allocating resources uh, we drafted episodes storytelling and so on and so forth and we didn't actually earn any public yeah so we hardly earned any and yes the shows are interactive and as a parent or as a worker with the children so to say there was some kind of cognitive dissonance so i'm saying that i will not allow my child to sit in front of a monitor all day long but then the kindergarten was online so we were trying to reduce the duration of the performances uh, maximum one or two events 30 minutes per week so i personally wasn't agree uh, didn't agree to invite the children to sit in front of the monitors for hours after the events uh, public theaters started to put on uh, free shows so our shows were not exactly free of charge in in the sense that uh, it they were on donations so we had to stop at some point i don't know i guess that we had uh, some things to earn mm, because uh, we saw that people from uh, all over Romania were watching us and even people from abroad but we didn't realize how we could ensure the quality of the image the pixels how we can offer the same quality online uh, than the quality we can offer uh, in a live show yeah so it's it's very difficult it seems easy but it's difficult yeah we work with the uh, we adapted that classical hungarian text uh, we played it several times in in different uh, different towns but uh, we also had online presence so actually we played online it was a live show broadcasted online and after a while i realized that I'm saying the monologue, but I see myself on the screen, so I have no idea of how the public reacts. And then I lost the appetite. Although 
this performance is highly interactive and there was the possibility to make comments however it wasn't the real thing uh, we do feel the negative impact of the pandemic lots of things happened uh, it's not only the effect of the pandemic in May this year, we had an opening, uh, it was full house. And then the second performance, the next day, there were 20 people in the public. So before the pandemics, we used to have public. Now it is very difficult to, uh, to join people together. So, I'm quite disappointed because during the pandemic people didn't realize, they, people realized that they didn't actually need theater, not that they didn't miss theater. And this has been a, a big disappointment for me, for us. Yeah, mm, something strange happened to us during the pandemic. We had a, a story house. It's the memorial houses in Cluj and uh, creation workshops in Cluj and the trips uh, for people to discover these memorial houses. And then it happened that we went into the countryside and uh, there was no internet. And of course, we didn't want to choose another school. Now that school has a little bit of internet, not too much. And the road has been fixed as well. Anyway, we haven't chosen that school for its accessibility, but we fell in love with that school a couple of years ago. But uh, instead of going online, we had to find a solution to go physical. So we had to go to the uh, to hospitals and we had to go to different places to be there, a flesh and blood, because we couldn't just switch to online. In the hospital wards, for instance, uh, patients needed to see us live because there was no infrastructure from, for online. Uh, performances. Of course we had workshops that uh, weren't joined by the public but we had to get creative because our public from the hospital wards uh, didn't have uh, online access anyway. So all these seem very useful uh, for me, for us. We need to organize virtual tours as well of these memorial houses because you may be from uh, another angle of Romania and you are curious how this memorial house in Cluj looks like. So you had to ensure the audio material, so digital material. So I guess that some parts of the online are really, really uh, worthwhile keeping. There was a problem there. Many people was, were really thinking what will be, um, especially in, in, in the expensive towns, what the future will bring for us and our projects. And some kind of a deprofessionalization uh, uh, form appeared. And the pandemic, <coughs> and from the, uh, it, was, it, it had some good aspects like uh, 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 asking ourselves the questions what we want to do, what is relevant to, to do and in, in that point or after that, po that, mo that moment. Everyone found themselves on a very unpredictable terrain or grounds. <clears throat> there were certain anxieties there and we are still working uh, to sort out those problems. The pandemic is over, but, the, it, but its influences and effects are still here we need to ask the questions to our uh, to ourselves uh, uh, related to our work uh, 
and the, the efficiency and the effectiveness of our work in the spaces uh, uh, we try to reorganize and restructure our activities, how we can maintain our energy, keep our energy and produce even better results. This is how we succeeded to reach the idea of producing less and uh, maybe not every performance need to be uh, uh, performed five times in a row and so on and uh, we we have two shows going on uh, in series of, of two shows in uh, playing a performance in a, in a, in a day the same people in very different things they re repeating it because they work they are working in putting it on the stage playing in it and then removing everything and this is how we are trying to organize our activity better and in that sense we did not really feel uh, uh, that the audience was missing at that point for instance in reactor on the 21st uh, of march and then in april we played it again only was something benefic for us people i repeat feel very differently about it and they have got their own anxieties they don't know what will come out of that where this thing leads us the future is very uh, dim and and difficult for us i've got two more questions more complex questions uh, because i'm trying not to ask seven different questions you're talking about your activities and your educational theater and i would like to ask first who in romania is really doing that uh, job is there a faculty pedagogy psychology faculty and what exactly the educational part uh, means what does that mean you are talking about educating the public public and how do you identify the needs of the children do you have case studies how do you know what their, what their needs are when you produce uh, shows for them I know that um, educational theater does not exist at the university. Or maybe this was the first year when they had some some program in the university. This is something new that was not yet experimented, and we don't know how it will be. We hope it will be okay, it will work, but we don't know that. Educational theater in our work and in our work and in, in my colleagues' work in these activities, in these practices, are present. And that, that's all I wanted to say. When I'm talking about educational theatre, I'm thinking of a very strict genre. I'm, I'm not sure if... I'm, I'm not sure if, if all of us understand the same thing when we are talking about that because there are these terms in Hungarian and English, what exactly it, it, it means for us. I'm talking about a show, a performance, not necessarily in the most strict sense of the word, a very participative one with a lot of interruptions, when there are conversations going on with the audience and the public. And I would really be interested to hear your opinions and you as viewers or you as the audience what do you think about that about various aspects improvisations uh, and so on and all these events that i would like to call events here have got the theme a very uh, clear theme for instance to give you a, an example we have got a, a show about Carl the little crow we played that for smaller children but we also did that for 
for bigger children also it's it's a crow that cannot sing because it's a crow and and the, and this little crow is sent to a musical school because uh, his parents want uh, uh, want want him to become a singer these are the expectations it's about the expectations of parents about young people how they how they deal with that how they can accommodate uh, you, you cannot talk about direct uh, about these things directly but through this tale of the little crow they uh, 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 somehow get in touch with uh, with the topic I wouldn't say we are experts of the field but we are very interested theater is there you are there as an actor and you need to be very uh, much available uh, in that particular moment but at the other, at, uh, on the other hand, you need you need to be present for them as well, and you have to maintain a conversation with them. That's what they do. Uh, we couldn't really hear the question. I was saying that theater in education is something that should be uh, done in the school not not only on the level of theater that's why i was asking if you are thinking of that uh, how, how do you see this project of theater in education just a little because that's that's the important thing we are talking about different things what you are talking about theater in education <coughs> it's something different uh different from what uh, levy has just said I wouldn't say it doesn't exist in Romania. In Cluj, I was referring to the fact that at the University of Cluj, uh, it, it has just been started. I will return a little bit to the, the notion of education. I was, I think there is a, uh, some legislation needed, a little uh, something that, that is a little above us and uh, so that we can have access to the classes and be introduced in the curriculum I think it's illegal now for us to enter uh, to the classes and uh, and uh, be part of the curriculum for the time being. It's not possible. I think it's more important to have a dialogue and the process of documentation. Somehow uh, a, a performance that is dedicated to a younger audience. And I was always asking my, to myself whether my projects are for my generation or for uh, or other generations to bring younger people to talk about their needs and uh, for that indeed more serious documentation is needed uh, I'm not able to go and do education uh, in school although all our projects are contemporary based on contemporary dramaturgy and on the needs of, of, of the people and somehow they have got an echo I'm thinking uh, of answering uh, the question. In the beginning, this had very much uh, to do with us. What we did not really like uh, in the school. So that's why we created a, a show or a performance of scientific experiments which looked a little bit like a class we didn't know at that point that there is such a thing as fun science and so on and so forth we wanted to uh, organize a class in which you experiment various things in various fields and domains in the in the beginning there were 10 minutes of mathematics 10 minutes of drawing 10 minutes of chemistry 10 minutes of music 10 minutes of physics so something like that. In the meantime, we changed it. And what did not change, though, was that uh, we were requested to go to the school and, and the performance was played for children uh, from very, uh, very low ages, like two years till eight years or uh, 18. Science can be entertaining. And in that sense, there are all kinds of experiments in included in the show that are explained in the language in a language or in in a, in a way that is understood by the audience by the children 
to learn from the mistakes, for instance, to encourage questions. And all this part with the school and science can really be an entertaining thing if you try to look at it from a, from a different perspective. That, that is perhaps connected to the question. Oh, there was another question regarding uh, to, to the theater. Yes. Personally, I also worked as an animator in parties, at parties, uh, in order to obtain some money. And I learned what is going on in a party where children meet each other, the difference between uh, magnet children, for instance, or very rich children, and how you can involve them into various small games to play, or in the villages, uh, what can I do there in, in, in a community like that, so do it a little bit differently, some kind of exercises in acting, and so on and so forth. And in that sense, that kind of activity existing, we try to diversify it and collect information right on the spot. We did not really ask them directly, but we really reached some kind of a conclusion based on uh, how they behaved. And that's how we succeeded to obtain the information. In our case, it's not we don't have a methodology in place, some kind of didactical things for activity with, with youngsters or young adults. We try to create equality between the audience and the trainers and, and, and us, uh, uh, trainees and us. In various places, actors coordinated such activities. We could not imagine what kind of local values would come out in various places, whether we organize an exhibition or bring a sheep or bring a grandmother who is doing needlework or n knitting. We did not know what are the objectives, what are the specific topics that come out. Anything could come out of it. That was that kind of freedom we had. We had a, a acting or class or dramaturgy class all kinds of tales with various characters could be placed on a board and they could carry on with the story in whichever direction they wanted to it wasn't something very specific uh, really premeditated before I think it's very useful and it's very valuable that they produce things they don't usually do to come up with new ideas. Maybe one of them go to a theater and they will go to an other course that they like more, a course of photography. You have got that kind of openness of mind so you can choose what exactly you are interested in and want to learn more about. And before we had these theatrical performances we went uh, very much to various subjects that were important for a certain category of people. What the relevant, one of the most relevant shows was entitled Three Million. That was uh, before the referendum about the gay marriages. There was, there was some kind of theatrical performance uh, based on various resources and various interviews. And if you looked at the performance or watched it, you could really take the part of any side, take, uh, take sides, it wasn't really uh, visibly given any kind of direction that you had to identify with this or that view. They, they were very finely and beautifully constructed these shows so that you can find yourself wherever you want in that issue. The liberty of expression and the liberty of affiliating uh, and uh, the liberty of asking questions. And after that, during the conversations we had, uh, it was interesting to see uh, that they really raised the question of whether they were right or wrong in their perceptions or their, their ideas beforehand. It's more uh, uh, like that in our case, not really connected to the school curriculum. I uh, understand that our time is over. We even 
passed it. Uh, we, we even uh, exceeded our time for this uh, discussion. A couple of keywords I would still like to hear. And while we are waiting some kind of cultural policies that would take more in serious our work, uh, I would like you to say a few keywords that are connected to your work. And thank you very much for your presence here. Your teams, I mean, keywords that are relevant for your teams so that your work is more financially supported or my, more recognized as a public service, more visible and so on and so forth. Stability, predictability, perhaps. Two very important keywords. Money, time and space. Five keywords. Money, of course, that's important. We have all kinds of funding sources, but we never know what comes next. We would like more dedicated funding and more, uh, more tailored to our needs. Money. That's, that's true, a very important keyword. And maybe a better organization of communication. We still meet each other every now and then. And we know, of course, uh, our each and uh, uh, the stories of each other. And this happens in various places in the country. On the other hand, we don't always know what kind of real needs are with the NGOs. And there are, there are a couple of... Uh, couple of counties where there is just one or maybe two uh, NGOs. Connection. Connection would be an important keyword. I was uh, going, I was, I was thinking of team, teams, and I think a psychotherapist is or, or a psychologist is would also be needed, especially after this uh, very difficult period that we had lived through. And I don't know, perhaps it's strange some kind of an organizer i think it is needed that that an organize an organizer that wouldn't do anything else but organize because we all do all kinds of things and then we reach burnout and uh, i think someone would be needed to be paid and uh, e expected to organize so the rest of us can really take care of the things we are good at let's not do each and every of us, all the things by ourselves. Okay, thank you very much for your participation in our meeting. And I would be really great, it would be really grateful to sign the list of participants. It would be very important for us for documentation purposes. The list is there.
Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tomás Jász, I am a theater critic and uh, uh, curator from uh, Hungary. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to moderate this uh, discussion and I introduce very shortly our guests uh, today. Uh, Claire Marshall is from the UK. As you can see already, uh, uh, she is representing Come to Co, uh, which is an organization uh, part of the National Rural Touring Forum, and she will tell very soon some more details on it. We have Yulia Popovici here, uh, who is a, a Romanian performing arts critic and, uh, and an expert uh, on European and Romanian cultural policies. And, uh, and who is, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't uh, manage to memorize, so uh, part of the National Reco Recovery and the Resilience Plan, somehow, but she will uh, 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 tell us what does it mean practically. And we have Chobor Kölö as well, here, uh, and actually in this uh, round table you are not representing Shoshin, but you, you are here because you know some more rural touring models uh, from Europe that can be uh, interesting for us. And I am I'm very grateful to Miki Bonishta and uh, our uh, previous uh, uh, participants of the previous uh, discussion because during this very exciting and interesting talk there were some keywords, if you like, uh, that are closely connected our topic, uh, just to mention a few, like reaching the audience or returning to the community, um, what are the shows easy to set up, um, what about the institutional background, the, the new ways or new forms of communication between audiences and spectators, the needs of the communities, um, and the reliable person, we talked about this as well. So these are just a few, um, few terms, a few keywords. Uh, I think we will, we will rely. But first of all, I, I would like to ask Claire to make a short presentation of, of what is Kantikov, because she prepared a wonderful PPT for you. And of course, uh, we would like to know more about the National Rural Touring Forum. So 
I'm mainly going to talk about Come to Cove and the model that we run, because obviously that's what I know the best. But all of the touring schemes really run on a very similar model in the UK. So my presentation is really to remind me of what I do, as well as to show you some pictures. Um, so I've got to navigate now, pressing the buttons and speaking to the microphone. So bear with. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, so Palm to Cove is um, Cornwall's performing arts scheme, as I said. So we're one of the national net network. So um, there's just a lovely picture to illustrate a bit of the Cornish landscape. So we're a very rural part of the UK. Um, there's a lot of economic deprivation in Cornwall. It's seen as a beautiful place because a lot of people go on holiday there, and it is a beautiful place to live. And if I, if I grew up there, and I live there. But um, the, corner, the population of Cornwall are, you know, large, large parts of our population um, live, live in poverty, and there are people who grow up four miles away from the beach who have never been to the beach before. So it's a, 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 a county of extremes. You know, there's a lot of wealth, and second homes are a big um, part of our um, economy. So lots of people come there on holidays, and then they. They buy homes that the local people can't afford to buy. So lots of our villages are suffering from a sort of drain of the population. And we exist in a way for the Cornish population. So we, our programme is generally in the non-tourist season. So our, our programme events is primarily for the local population, not for the tourists. Not that we don't love the tourists, we do. So as a, as a national network, the NRTF has around 30 member schemes, as I say, from, from Cornwall up to um, Scotland and the whole of Wales as well. And so on a local level, we might be very small scale in our village halls, and our network is are, are small, so our, our, um, the scale of the work that we programme is small, but as a whole, we have quite a large voice, a large footprint, and you know, a lot of turnover is generated through the work that we do. So as you can see, there are 30 schemes, 1,650 promoting groups, which are primarily volunteers. So most of our promoters are volunteers who live in their communities, and they give up 110,000 volunteer voluntary hours. And we show our events to around 330,000 people and over a million pounds is generated in lots of sales. This is in a typical year and this is basically pre-pandemic numbers. We're still struggling a little bit to get back to those numbers. But we exist in order to enable the communities to present something that's a little bit different to what they should do so we financially support them. We're funded to do that. Um, and we kind of... Our ethos is very much doing with, not doing to. So we work with the communities, as I say, they're volunteer promoters who live in the communities. They choose what they want. We don't tell them what they have to program. It's it's very much done at the grassroots level. Um, but we are funded so that we can pay the artists a, 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 a professional fee, so that we don't subsidise the artists. We pay them a fair wage we subsidise the communities so that they do not have to take financial risk on putting on a professional event. We kind of feel that just because you live in a rural area, there's no reason that you can't have access to really high quality professional touring work. So we work so that we can bring performers to very small communities. And um, as I said, we, we subsidise that risk for the promoter. So how does it work? Our scheme works, and as I say, most of them work along the same lane, um, same models. We, as an organisation, and we're very small scale, as myself and one other person in our team, we put together a programme of events, a menu we call it, and we um, put that together from seeing work, um, having contact, having networks, and having experience of working with companies, you know, there are, um, companies that work in rural touring throughout their career, so they are they they um, create their work with rural touring in mind, and um, we don't see that as a limitation. We don't see the fact that it's small scale and 
global as being a limitation on the kinds of work that we offer. We try and challenge our audiences as much as entertain them. So we put together this menu, we try and get a broad range of different types of events, and then we offer these out to our promoters, we invite them to a menu party, we come together twice a year in an event just like this. I'm standing here with PowerPoint, they're sitting there listening to what we're presenting, everybody brings a plate of food, we share it with the interval, artists come and um, perform little extracts or speak about their shows, and they meet the promoters during the break, and this is really lovely sort of hub of conversations, everybody kind of gets to know each other a bit better. Um, and then they choose one event per season that we subsidise and we encourage them to look others. So we've got experienced promoters in our network and they are quite happy to take a risk on, on certain shows that they know that they can sell and then ask Cartico to support one that's a little bit out of their comfort zone. And that's what we love is when we kind of offer out a range of things on a different subsidised model. So that's just a little picture of our team, and we had four of us, now we're only two, um, and we made a film, so if you're interested in seeing it, we, it's a sort of love letter really to come to Pope that we made last year on our anniversary, and it's on our website, so please um, have a look and watch it at, um, in your leisure. So um, a typical, so here are some stats, I always love stats, and I kind of, we, we take a lot of data from our audiences and from our promoters and artists, and every now and again I crunch those and I look at the pictures and the graphs and I think, oh, yeah, it is amazing what we do. So we typically have around 8,500 people attending, around about 115 events per year, so we average about 72. Um, audience numbers in each show and that varies because some of our halls are tiny and a maximum capacity is sell out audience is 50 people um, and then we work in town halls as well which are larger um, so they can have up to 400 people but it's generally our average size of venue is around about 120 hours now. Oops. Um, as I said before, we pay artists a full fee, so they don't have to take a risk or do a box office split with the promoter. Um, we um, spend around £65,000 of, um, of our budget each year on artist fees, which is about um, well over half of it. And that's then on artists that are from Cornwall, so we have quite a healthy network of artists making work in Cornwall. We also, we kind of see it as our job really to, to bring artists from up the line, sort of little further out, outside of, within the UK and even internationally, we bring artists into Cornwall so that we can um, give our audiences access to like a really good wealth of talent from, from all over. Um, ticket sales are the second um, biggest part of our budget, so we get funding from the government and the Arts Council, so we have public funded money which we put into the, to the scheme. We're also supported by our local authority, and then we generate uh, extra income. So the way the finances work is the village hall will pay us 80% um, of the box office takings that they make on the show, and they keep 20%
coming out and being with friends and family in the community is really important to our audiences. Um, our reputation, comes Coast reputation, and performing arts is an important part of who I am. These were score really highly. Um, nobody really comes to our events for peace and quiet. <laughs> generally always know each other and they feel the sense that it's their space and that the artist has been invited into their space. So when you're an artist performing in a rural touring venue, then um, it, I imagine it's quite a different experience to work in the Black Box Theatre. You, you're going into the space, the, the community come out and see you, but they kind of own the space, they want to talk to you because you've come into their space. So it's very rare that an artist will come in and leave without having um, had a sort of social time with the audience. They'll help them clear away at the end of the night if they want the help or not. Um, sometimes they can stay overnight in the village so they'll be given a bed in a promoter's house or at some the village and they'll be given a hot meal and really, really looked after. Um, in Cornwall we have a performing arts university, Hamlet University, and we have quite a lot of young artists coming out of there. Um, new graduates and emerging companies, so we'd like to support those and offer them a platform so that they continue to work in Cornwall. Um, so we support artists throughout all parts of their careers. There are some really established artists um, living and working in Cornwall as well. We've been um, doing rural touring or small scale theatre performances all their careers, and there are um, others around, as I say, around. And as I said at the beginning, it's really important for us to feel that we're connected internationally. And so we have, um, as, a, as a southwest region in, in the UK, we have a really close connection to our southwest neighbours. And we often program tours from European companies um, who tour the southwest. So we make a coherent tour and it makes it much more um, valuable um, and cost effective for the company to come. And we are also mindful of our place in our in our in, in the cultural sector of Cornwall because Cornwall is you know, quite the creative industries are quite important to the local economy. We don't have apart from tourism, we don't have very much industry, but creatively we work, you know, we offer a lot of opportunities and so we can't own works. As we are a network, we connect with our own cultural sectors in Cornwall. And I think, yeah, that's the end of that slide. I'm not going to talk about it, but I'll that back over there. Perfect, thank you very much. But hopefully that will give that gives you a sort of general idea of what we do. Yeah, I think it gives more than a general idea because of. So after listening to your presentation uh, from an Eastern European perspective, you know, it feels like we are in the realm of utopia. So thank you very much. It was, and, and that's, I think, it was a good decision, a good suggestion from Chandler to start with this presentation today, because now the question is on the table: Are there any other uh, countries in Europe, you know, or other systems, you know? that are so <coughs> multi-leveled and that so many uh, you know, promoters and artists and, and everything that work in a, in a so complex network like the, like the UK model. So what are your... Yulia, I ask you about the Romania situation, shortly of course, then we can ask stronger about the other part of Europe. Well, I have to... Yes, tours in the countryside so that it is a national scheme because Estonia again it is very small so that each uh, person can have uh, access to a performance within 50 kilometers of its residence the his or her residence um, so there is uh, a national planning let's say uh, there are certain productions that are done especially for touring because not Every uh, village uh, has the infrastructure for huge uh, set design and so on, and lighting and, and so on. Uh, and um, 
or the neighborhoods, and it covers the whole country. But again, Estonia is the size of Cluj, the entire Estonia. Um, well, in Romania, we don't have uh, a system yet, and we don't know, we don't know uh, uh, how many people have access to, to a theater within no matter how many kilometers. Uh, mm, but we have a plan. Uh, the planning in general started the, there's a history of it. It starts in the dark times of communism when uh, theaters were uh, uh, supposed to, were asked to tour. And there were two elements of it in the 1980s, so starting with 1984. First, they had this uh, obligation of touring, and then starting with that year, they had covered their expenses uh, up to 70%. Uh, which meant that the, uh, the touring uh, got a new, a new importance because it helped somehow gathering the money to cover such a large percent of self-financing. Uh, but at the same time, it was a time when uh, there was no heating and electricity uh, in a generous manner in Romania, something that we all remember now in the current context, uh, which means that uh, professional artists, and I, in that context by professional artists, I mean art, art, theater artists that were employed in theaters, in public theaters, uh, developed a sort of a uh, intense hate uh, towards touring, especially in the countryside, uh, which coupled with another event, something else that is related to the second part of the 70s and 80s, which is the, uh, a festival, a national-wide national -wide festival called the Song of Romania, that put on the same level of professional artists and amateur artists, which developed for the professional artist, um, a frustration towards amateur theater, which means that we enter the 1990s with professional artists that hated going in the countryside and hated having somebody without a diploma doing theater. Um, the, 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 General despise towards amateur theater is still very vivid in Romania. You can almost feel it from the part of, of uh, again, professional theater. So, theater artists that are actually involved in um, big production and so on. Um, well, but in the same time, the countryside, the countryside had and still partially still has uh, a large infrastructure, uh, the, the famous uh, houses of culture. Uh, and so, jumping to 2009, uh, so, uh, sort of 20 years after, when the, the, the hatred towards uh, touring in the countryside decided a little, or there was a new generation that didn't develop such a, hadn't developed such a hatred. Uh, and a group of independent artists uh, first developed a pilot and then came to the Ministry of Culture culture with the proposition of public policy for the reactivation of, of these culture, houses of culture for uh, touring theater. The project was called uh, 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 Touring in the Countryside, Touring in the uh, It was part of a sort of a, a, a whole vision about building communities through theater. Uh, by a group of, of young theater makers, from Dutch churches to even the cities of the, uh, at that point, Alice Monica Marinescu, some of them, uh, some of them, uh, some of them then developed some other lines of, of working that strictly related to, to this recreation of the house of, of the cultures. Um, uh, first, the, the, the pilot program meant that uh, they, uh, well, they produced a certain a performance, which was based, which was based on real facts about something that happened in a uh, small uh, countryside school, 
and then they presented it in, in, in part of the like, rural communities, uh, communities in which they had, let's say, some connections. So, you know, so they wanted to enter a community, not to present them an outside product, artistic project. So somehow they were, uh, they, they relied on personal connections. The, the, the birth village of the father of one of the artists and so on, you can imagine. Uh, and actually, well, one, of the, one of the things, I, I was several such performances in the black communities, and what was absolutely marvelous, it was, that, uh, it was the fact that it activated uh, different generations of, of members of the community some of them uh, uh, having memories about the cultural activities in, the, in those places, the houses of culture, uh, which went from theater performances from the city uh, to uh, popular music in which they were involved. Uh, but then the, uh, the Minister of Culture was changed. You know, we have a specialty in changing the Ministries of Culture of the Socks. Uh, and everything done. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, aspiring public policy. Uh, but then, a few years afterwards, there was another initiative that celebrated uh, 10 years, last year, I think, called Culture in the Bar, Cultura and Shul, Cultura and Shul. Uh, which is somehow uh, similar uh, in the idea of uh, presenting uh, a performance, a theater performance, not an educational project, not an therapy thing, not something related to vulnerable groups. I will go back to that in a moment, in a very short But without using the infrastructure. Uh, because what happened between 2009 and 2015, uh, something like that, uh, was that. Uh, uh, some of the houses of culture were rehabilitated but without a very precise purpose and others somehow disappeared into the night of the wedding organization. Um, and because uh, some of these houses of culture were very politicized by the connection, well, you know, the, the local political so they, want, they are doing this in the courtyard of one, of one person of the village or another. They are not coming to places that, where they have personal connections. They develop these connections. They install themselves in the courtyard of a, a local. And they work with locals uh, in developing a performance that is actually done by them and they are, they are well, they are not amateurs. Uh, so they are professional actors, but in the new definition of it. So they are not involved. And uh, the addressability varies because what they, uh, well, uh, they are developing the performance there because they have a repertoire of several things and they want to adapt to the specifics and the needs of the community. And the addressability is as large as possible, so from children, without being children in this theater, so let's say 10 years old, uh, to older people. So, which means that a certain language is required to, to, and, and, and so on. And uh, that means it with some financing from the National Cultural Fund uh, and the, uh, a variety of local support. But actually, uh, Differently from what happened with, uh, uh, during in the countryside, they don't want a public policy and they don't want to deal with the, with the state. Uh, they are receiving these uh, 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 funds from the National Cultural Fund, which, okay, the maximum for uh, uh, performing uh, for performances, for performance production, is uh, 17,000 euros. That's the mess. And you have to cover anything. And because it is the only national source of money, uh, the competition is harsh. So 
So now, with 70,000 euros, you have to uh, buy the cow, feed the cow, uh, kill the cow, sell the cow, and so on. You know, everything. Uh, but uh, they, can, they receive this money because uh, at some point, uh, uh, the, those entitled to do it introduced uh, among the, the, the criteria, the priority criteria to finance projects in, in uh, RHMA. Uh, this, uh, you know, uh, contributing to places that are, don't have an access to culture. Uh, usually, it means uh, uh, developing uh, um, educational projects. Uh, but the problem with education is so we do have a line of, a line of production in theater based on educational projects. But again, this is something that is uh, disconnected for everything else. So uh, uh, there's no policy on, we don't even know what part of the map is covered by these projects. We don't know. They are happening in some places. Uh, we uh, even uh, need to uh, see a situation where in the same village, the same community, after uh, a, huge, uh, a bigger project was developed there, two years afterwards, there was another project going there because they didn't know what happened previously. <laughs> um, so it is very disconnected because uh, the, how communities are chosen by the operators is very random. Independent communities, they know. Uh, where uh, local authorities are not open. Uh, where the distance is reasonable from where the artists come from, because with 70,000 euros, you can come from Bucharest to the most most of the It's quite costly. And uh, it starts, uh, uh, so the access to this kind of project for the, the members of the community starts when they reach like 14 years. There's nothing for over the 14 years. Um, what's going to happen with uh, the RF so the, for those of you who don't know because and I don't know who, who doesn't know it. <laughs> Every country in the European Union has this recovery and resilience plan. Uh, and in the, the, with money from the European Commission and in uh, the recovery and resilience plan of Romania, there's one very small thing, which is a, a pilot program of financing for cultural projects in places with less than, having less than 50,000 people living on it. Where there is, a, a, no matter how little, co-financing from the local authority. Which means, well, local, very local, or regional. And uh, the fund is for, the, for this part of program, which also will extract data about where these projects happen. What's the national distribution? Uh, so, which will also uh, uh, gather the information where are the, those local authorities willing to support something like that. Uh, and it has a, a, a budget of 4 million euros, which is more than the, the funds for one session of APCNE for all the arts. So that we have the, 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 the level of poverty here and that and why we are trying to, well, turn one cow in ten cows with 70,000 euros. Um, so, whoever among you is interested, there's this problem, there's uh, uh, the draft of the kites for this program in the market and uh, it will happen because if we don't spend this money, that's that's the nicest part with the recovery and resilience plan. If you don't do it and if you don't spend that money, all the financing stops. So not doing this, this program for financing pro culture projects in small communities, Romania won't have money for highways. <laughs> Um... Uh -huh.
I, uh, yeah, well, it was very... Intense. Yeah, it was very intense. Yeah, that, that was the word I mean. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, and you know, I was thinking maybe, maybe I, I would stop a bit uh, stronger because I think it's, uh, it makes sense to just to, just to show how things work in Hungary. Actually, I brought. Uh, it's not a present, but I can, I can, I can hire it to you. Um, it's called Dirini Magazine. Um, it's a, it's a promotional material uh, for Dirini program, uh, which is uh, which is just take a look at it. Um, which uh, actually was made in 2020 to uh, to send theater shows in Hungary uh, to the countryside. And uh, I'm very glad that Julia mentioned some uh, historical roots uh, of the Romanian situation. We also have to mention uh, just a few words. Uh, uh, also the old times or the, uh, the old times in Hungary because in 1950s, from the 1950s to the 1970s, there was a, a theater called the State Dirine Theater in Hungary, and its aim was to send shows to the countryside. Uh, for those who, who do not know Dirine, um, she was an actress, um, so we can translate it as Mrs. Dairy. Uh, she was an actress in the mid 19th century, an iconic uh, actress of Hungarian culture. Uh, I think. Uh, the name of the program also uh, gives an impression to what uh, 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 what uh, history, what tradition it goes back to, and uh, uh, this new DNA program, founded in 2020, uh, it was made by the National Theatre in Budapest. Um, you know, in Hungary, we believe in, 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 in centralizing everything, so. Uh, uh, so a nine-member committee uh, uh, closely connected to the uh, management of the National Theatre, they do decide on which shows uh, to present in the countryside uh, and so on and so on. And now I just checked out their homepage and it says that in this uh, season, so the 2022-23 season, uh, you in the or anyone in the countryside can order a show. Uh, they have like more than 100 shows um, uh, online uh, where you can you can choose from. Uh, if you have a venue uh, and you can order these shows, there are different groups. I won't won't go into details, um, but um, you know what is interesting. Um, and, and, and maybe later we can talk about it, that um, uh, the DNA program, they pay for everything. I, feel, I mean, for the artists, for the venue, they pay every cost. Uh, when I go there as a spectator, I have to pay for a ticket for 200 forints, which is uh, half euro, so it's practically nothing. Uh, you know, the average ticket price, yeah, the ticket price in Hungary is like uh, 8 to 10 euros or for the more expensive shows it's like uh, 20, 25 euros uh, so you can compare it with this half euro price um, Where do they play? Well, this, uh, this network of, of, of houses of culture we also have in Hungary from the dark times, from the communist times and you know, the, in the last uh, 30 years, nobody used them actually because you know they are huge buildings with no real function. So uh, these shows are invited many times there, and you know it's a very, uh, I think it's a very exciting initiative because in, in Hungary uh, practically there is no cultural mobility. So everything is concentrated in Budapest, in the capital of Hungary. And in the countryside, it's it's very very difficult to uh, to see small independent productions. Of course, we have we have uh, the system of the so-called uh, stone theaters. It was uh, uh, made after the Second World War, and you know uh, we always say that the biggest um, uh, uh, I don't know, 
right of, of Hungarian theater is the, uh, uh, the system of these stone theaters, uh, the, the, the ensemble, the repertory, and so on and so on. Um, but, um, but in the last decades, uh, nobody wanted to uh, 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 nobody wanted to deal with those people in the countryside who do not have the chance to see uh, um, uh, high quality theater show. And during a program wants to do something like that, but there are many many uh, uh, problematic uh, aspects uh, of this thing. Um, and there are very, uh, I would say, spectacular numbers, uh, of course, for the, for the last season, and they have huge plans. Uh, they have uh, their own company, they have a brand new venue, very close to the National Theatre, actually. Uh, they have all the money they need, uh, but it's, it comes all from above. So it has nothing to do with, with the communities their needs, uh, their desires. Uh, someone from the center, from the National Theatre, decides what is good for you and what is not. Which is, a, I think it's a very special Hungarian model. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Chambor, now it's your turn. And uh, of course you don't have to go into details with all the other models you, 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 you know from Europe. I know you have some knowledge about the Italian, the Swedish, the, the Norwegian model, and of course uh, the Romanian model as well. Uh, but um, so how can you connect to these, uh, these, uh, these thinkings uh, you, you heard before? Okay, um, so yeah, one of the models that I know of besides the besides the UK model is uh, the Swedish one, which is also a national network uh, that covers the whole country uh, in existence for several decades as well. Uh, one of the differences uh, compared to the English uh, model, uh, the Swedish one is called Riksteater, the, the big national one, and then this Riksteater has smaller agencies in the different regions. So you will have Riksteater in Badland and so on. Uh, but one of the big differences compared to the way it works uh, in the UK, where you are practically trying to collect a pool of artists uh, who they all develop their own work wherever they can, is that in Sweden, this Riksteater has a very big factory in Stockholm uh, of uh, several levels where they have uh, uh, rehearsal rooms and studios for artists to work in. So they basically commission artists to, uh, to, to do new work with rural touring in mind, so specifically for rural audiences. Um, and they give them these spaces in this, I don't know, four or five story uh, theater factory. Uh, they give them the money to, to, to pay themselves for their rehearsal work, for their creation, uh, and they give them the money to, to, uh, to make these productions, which then get toured uh, in the network. Um, and this is all state funded. Um, and so, sort of, you don't have to always uh, uh, put forward an application um, and so on. This system is, is rock solid, uh, it, is, it, it is funded, you can, you can count on it as an artist that if you wish to engage with this kind of work, if you are not only thinking about Milano and Sydney and New York, uh, then you have the opportunity to do it. And this is, it's work. You can live from it and it has value. Um, okay, another uh, model that I know and I would like to mention is the Norwegian one, which uh, they have a program called the Cultural Rucksack. This is a program destined, uh, uh, aimed not at um, adults, but at children, 
They work together with all the schools in Norway. Again, it's a, it's a national model with national funding, with regional um, agencies working uh, um, in, with the schools in their uh, region. Um, and this uh, cultural rucksack uh, basically allows each school in the country to host at least one professional performance a year for, for the pupils. So uh, what is valuable for me in this model is that the way the pupils get to see a performance and come in contact with the artists and with different art forms, not just theater, but also dance or, or music, uh, is not accidental, is not relying on if I know a school principal, or in the, in the school where I used to go, I still know the principal, so I will go to her. But if I don't know the, the principal in the school next door, then I will not go to them. So it, there is this accidental, is it going to happen or is it not going to happen? So here you would have schools where the pupils have the chance to watch, I don't know, five or 10 performances per year in their own school, so they don't have to go to a theater theater comes to them, um, and then there are schools where they don't get to see any performances at all. So this is why such a model for me is very exciting, because it, again, it, it gives continuity, and it gives stability, and it gives a sort of a guarantee that you will have access to it every year, year by year. And then another model is the uh, Italian one. Um, I received a PowerPoint from our Italian partners, but maybe it's... Maybe, okay, maybe we can uh, uh, just see a few slides from, from that. Um, this model, uh, in Italy they have regional organizations. So uh, one of these is uh, AMAT, Associazione Marchigiana Attività Teatrali, and so they work in the Marche region of, uh, of Italy. And there are several other similar uh, agencies or organizations in, in uh, other uh, regions. And these organizations, again, they receive money from the state in order to fund and finance artistic activity in their region. So this model is not just about rural, uh, uh, rural touring. Here you can see the region where, where they where AMAT develops uh, their work and the different provinces that, that make up uh, the region. It's not just about rural touring, so going to very small villages. You would have towns, bigger towns, smaller towns, but uh, again, it's this idea that you don't have to go to the, to, to the, to the big center, you know, to the big cultural center, for instance, like Cluj. Um, or to the capital, Budapest, to Bucharest, and so on. Uh, but you can have access to art and culture in, in other uh, smaller towns and villages as well. Um, so their funds come from ticketing, income from spectators, sponsors, uh, public money from the Ministry of, of Culture, um, and this money goes into making uh, new productions, into programming, and other uh, activities, like pedagogical, uh, uh, educational activities. Um, here we could see uh, that in 2019, for instance, Amat uh, had 823 shows in that year. Um, and there we can also see the funds that they were dealing with. So again, if I compare this to, I don't know, 17,000 uh, euro, it, there is a difference. <laughs> there is a difference. <laughs> a difference. Um, and they, as, as I said, it's not just about theater, it's also about dance, about music, about circus, contemporary circus, uh, different interdisciplinary <laughs> projects. <laughs> Um, they do contemporary theater, contemporary dance, uh, uh, contemporary you know, 
music, circus, and so on. These are some of the projects that AMAT was involved in, uh, European uh, projects. One of them is the Sparse, which you can see in the down right uh, corner. Is one uh, Creative Europe funded project that Shoshin was also involved in, um, in the last three years, where we were trying to, to develop, develop and implement a similar model to the, to the English one. Um, and then there are, there are, of course, other kind of, of projects as well, projects for the elderly. Um, this, they are trying to make uh, one of the towns a capital of culture. So this is the, this is the, just the presentation that our partners sent through, which I wanted to show you briefly. Um, these are the, the models that I know of, that I can think of, uh, and I can talk about generally, uh, not too specifically. And also maybe just shortly to add to, to, to what Julia was saying is uh, uh, about the culture and shooter. Uh, for instance, we, Shoshin, as I said, we, are, we try to develop this model for us. For instance, it's important to have this state funding. It's important to have a, a, a network. It's important to be able to count on that money. Um, so from this perspective, as even though being guerrilla is very uh, inspiring and romantic, I would still, me personally, I still believe in a system, a network, uh, which is publicly funded and which guarantees access to people, uh, for people to culture and arts. Again, so that it's not accidental. And I just wanted that to add one more thing to, the, to this uh, model of the 80s touring. There were state theaters in Romania which continued to, to implement this model even in the 2010s. For instance, uh, the, the theater from Mirkuriakchuk, uh, you know. Only the Hungarian speaking theaters because they serve a community. So this could be, yes, uh, but Bartol <laughs> uh, uh, who is a member of, of this uh, theater of, from Mirkuriakchuk is uh, here with us, so maybe at a certain point we can, we can uh, uh, connect her to say some words about did they really hate doing it? <laughs> and and where, where the theater is today, in 2020, with regard to, to this practice? Um, yeah. Um, I, uh, there, are, uh, there were, for instance, there are several theaters, children's theaters, that are still doing it. Uh, outside big cities, for instance, the Jagiellonian Theater in Budapest, which also is bilingual, and being funded by the regional council, it takes it seriously. So it takes seriously that it serves the community, the region, not only the city of Budapest. Something that does happen with the national theater in Budapest, which apparently serves the nation of Budapest. <laughs> The same with Kaiowa National Theatre, we have several, seven nations served by the national theatres. Uh, and, uh, well, individually, uh, let's not go into this, you know, there's a large uh, bibliography about how much they hate art, art actors hated going in the, into the countryside. <laughs> it's stuff of the legend. And definitely, uh, definitely affected uh, how many, because it, it, it's a long story, we played here for, uh, between 1990 and 2004, and with a leg in 2008, we played here the centralization, decentralization, centralization, decentralization game, uh, which ended up with uh, theaters being allocated to one authority or another according to whoever authority wanted them. So there's no plan why one theater is uh, subsidized by the local council and another one by the county. Uh, we don't even know why we have seven national theaters, but let's not go into them. Um, into that issue. 
issue. We have one national theater which is national, but it's subsidized by, uh, I don't know, so the, the, the local, uh, yes, local the city. Council, the city council. Yes. Sibiu. So it is national. Yeah, uh, the calls themselves also national. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a mystery. <laughs> uh, but the, the, but the, because the only reason was they played hide and seek with the theater in, in Galatz, for instance, in 1999. So it was given first to the uh, county council, so the regional council. Then it was, uh, 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 because the county council said we don't have money for it anymore, so you, you take it city hall. The city hall took it and get rid of the, of the manager the second day after. Uh, and, but the only reason was because the, the, the county said we don't have money this year, so we take it. So there's no, no uh, in, in, in the logic of things, according to the law and the public policies and blah, 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 a local theater should serve a local community, a county theater should serve the whole county, and the national theater, that's I don't know what to do. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 it is a question in Hungarian theater history as well in the last 200 years, so we still don't know the answer. Yeah, okay. I, I wanted to ask you guys because, uh, you know, for, for those uh, still uh, not sleeping, um, uh, uh, no, 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 no. So, uh, it, it, so, you know, there's a question uh, that arises. So, all these models, they are very different, but there are some, of course, some parallel situations and some parallel solutions and so on. So there's a naive question, why don't these countries uh, communicate with each other? And maybe it's time to speak a bit about sparse. Uh, if, if I am right, uh, this um, um, initiative tries to, to take this whole thing into a European level, uh, and I don't know if Claire or John Moore uh, would, would share some, some ideas on the working of, of SPARS because if I'm right, it leaves behind this uh, national context in a way. So, what about this? Okay. So, SPARS um, is a project. It, the, the name SPARS stands for Supporting and Promoting Arts in Rural Settlements. Europe and as um, Chomba said earlier, the UK was a, a lead partner, not Cantico, but um, a, a fellow ski was the lead partner in that project. And we, um, our role was really in mentoring um, for the four other partner countries Estonia, Lithuania, Italy, and Romania to set up rural touring models in those countries based on ours because we have had this long-standing kind of established model. So the beginning of the project, um, all of the organisations visited Cornwall and identified local promoters within their regions or their countries. In Estonia it was a national project as you say. And the promoters came to Cornwall and we gave them a trip around and we took them to see a show. Um, we introduced them to our local promoters and some artists and we kind of for three days, we kind of immersed ourselves in all things rural touring, and the, the local promoters from each country got to know each other and their fellow promoters, and then they went back, they took that learning to their own countries, and then they set up these three tours, three tours of the project, wasn't it, um, in their own countries, and they were all slightly different, depending on the needs and the, the sort of, the um, parameters of their, their country's needs, so, um, Estonia, our partner, was the National Dance Agency, so they focused on dance performances, but they were national. In Lithuania, it was a regional project in um, based in Klaipeda and around Western Lithuania. John will speak about the Romanian model, and uh, in Italy, as you've seen, it was in the Marque. And we, the project was three years long. The pandemic was in the middle of it, so it kind of impacted the activity and the, um, the numbers, our target numbers. But we made a film, Chomba did the evaluation of the project. And I think when we ended it at the end of last year, we all came together with the partners. And, you know, the reflection was what an amazing um, three years it had been, what an amazing journey we've been on. 
and the network now will continue. The Creative Europe project has ended and the UK um, input has ended because of our already mentioned exit. <laughs> Um, but the network continues, we're inviting more partners, and I think we're waiting on um, the results of the funding as far as to what, what that will become and how that network will de de develop with additional partners. So, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, yeah maybe just um, that uh, Sparks was the project uh, funded by Creative Europe, but uh, during the project, other um, other organizations from different countries uh, approached us saying we would like to take part. So uh, basically, at a certain point, we constituted what we call the Sparse Network, which is a network of about, I don't know, 25 organizations in different countries in, in Europe. Um, it's a, not a formal network, um, but it, it, what connects us, us is uh, these uh, shared aims. So uh, and this is something that anyone can, can, can join and we, we are trying to see in the future um, how we could function as a sort of a platform which would advocate uh, on a European level uh, for more serious funding for uh, arts in rural areas all around Europe. So this, this was the sparse and, and its little offsprings and potential, potential for developing. Yeah, so there is a European dialogue, or there might be a, a continuation of this, this dialogue. What has started with, with SPARS, so not only these separate models, national uh, uh, models, which is good to hear. Um, and of course, there are many, many questions uh, that arise, but um, uh, I, I strongly recommend there's, um, uh, this nine minutes uh, long or short film uh, on the YouTube channel of, of, of Kanto Cove, um, celebrating the 20th anniversary, and it gives, uh, I think, a perfect impression on your work. And and there are some there were some very interesting details for me in it. Um, for example, uh, when when there is a sequence about about the, the genres, and there is a, a circus artist speaking that uh, with the help of the National Laboratory Forum, they, uh, you know, they approached places they never imagined before. And, and I was thinking about, um, you know, so what, what is the, what are the, the, the ideal genres for, for rural touring? What is your experience? Uh, because, for example, circus and dance, mentioned in the Italian case, um, yeah, it, it, it sounds evident, though still surprising, I think, for, for, for many people. Um, and, you know, just, to, I think it would be nice to hear uh, a little about, uh, about, um, about, uh, about the shows themselves, so, so what are the, I don't know, the selection criteria, genre-wise or length-wise, and so on, so just to be um, Well, personally, I don't think there's any show that can't be shown in a rural context, really. I mean, some need more work than others, um, but actually, I don't think it should be a, you know, a, a negative in any company. I mean, the typical rural touring show is something that will go in the back of a van mm -hmm. and can be driven by the actors who are also the technicians, the stage manager, the tour manager. So, you know, there is a kind of requirement to be flexible and to get on with, you know, you turn up in a venue, you don't know what you're going to get. You might have an overhead light, you might have a rig, but you can't assume that you're going to have anything. So you need to be able to put your show on with what you can carry with you. Um, but, you know, in terms of genre, we have done circus tours and We've had Chinese poles in, in village halls. Um, we've done work outdoors, and we've had, um, you know, contemporary dance, which has been. I mean, personally, I, I feel that watching a, a contemporary dance performance in a village hall is the best place to see it. You're so close. <laughs> you can yeah. see the, the the sweat on the dancers' faces. You can hear the feet on the floor, and you're part of it. 
you know, when I see a, a dance show in a, in a big theatre now, I feel so removed. It, it kind of takes, it's a different experience for sure. Um, so there is an intimacy in rural touring, but I don't think it should be a pro pro prohibition to anything really being on the programme. And we have had really successful, well, I mean, there is additional kind of funding required to tour a dance show because it has more infrastructure in it, you know, that the costs are larger, but it, it, anything can be possible. What about the artistic side? I mean, the artist's side, so you just mentioned contemporary dance, uh, um, I think. Uh, uh, creators and artists of contemporary dance, they are used to different conditions, much different conditions. So what, what are the feedback, what is the feedback from, from, for example, them? Well, I think it's fair to say that if you're an artist who is new to rural touring, there is an element of kind of learning that you have to do, <laughs> that you, you, you have to go through. And so when we did the rural touring dance project, there was a, a, a lab that we set up for artists who haven't worked on rural touring before but were interested. So it was a residential lab for three days where they came um, and they met um, volunteer promoters and they went to the seat village halls and they kind of understood how their work might need to be adapted for a rural venue. You know, not having a dance floor is not impossible in, in a village hall, but it's sometimes it does need you know, a little bit of work and you need to kind of tour around with the dance floor and it kind of adds on to that thing. So there are expectations, I think, that need to be managed sometimes because, I, you know, I, I went to the Edinburgh Festival in August and I met with some companies who said to me, come and see my show, I really want to rurally tour it. And then you go and chat to them and, and you kind of think, they don't really want to rurally tour it. They want their show to be brought to theatre spaces in, in rural lo locations, but we don't actually have them. So they have, you kind of have to talk to them about what is actually possible with their big sets and their large casts and the requirement for a dressing room. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I just mentioned it before our discussion to John Moore that um, it might be a historical moment right now, you know, on the edge of everything, uh, the economic crisis, the pandemics, the war, and, and everything. And you know, this is a time when, uh, for example, in Hungary at least, uh, some theatres had to be closed down because they will not be able to pay the charges, or the gas and electricity. And I think uh, that's why talking about these different models uh, make a very strong sense today uh, because uh, as far as I can see and that is my question to you as well to all of you it might uh, so this, this, this kind of rural touring uh, might show an escape route for, for theaters in a way I think there's also um, the environmental kind of consideration touring is a bit not completely green, but it's a lot greener than running a big theatre. Mm -hmm. So the model of rural touring takes the show to people, and it, you know there is that kind of offsetting. So you know, as well as the economical, the economic factors, I think the environmental factors really do stand up when we talk about rural touring. Yeah. So I'm curious, what is your opinion uh, on, on on this topic? So um, <clears throat> yeah. for the, the stone theatres and a development of other forms of work because, yeah, okay, touring is, uh, has a lighter uh, uh, climate footprint, yes? Yes, but not if you take a big truck uh, uh, running on gas uh, from uh, Cluj to Yash uh, and then uh, uh, you come back because, well, you know, you only have one presentation there. So there's a whole thinking about how, how 
well, extending the network can also be, you know, as climate neutral as possible. Yeah, but of course, if you have, if you go there by your big truck, and uh, if you have like four or five performances in the uh, close area, yeah, you know, it, so it's not by itself. Mm -hmm. By itself, nothing is guaranteed. Not to mention that the whole, well, the whole global theater was running on touring, but it was, you know, touring by plane, which is not free at all. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, and on the other hand, we will see an increase of the use of technology on the par with going back to the analogic. But it, does, it doesn't prevent the, the need, the forced need for the big theaters to just change their production models and to change their, well, the, the whole thing with the big theater. Because, you know, it's it's not doable to just imagine that you take all the artists out from Bucharest to just spread them doing the rural theater around. That's not going to happen, including because it's not financial, financially sustainable. And the financial sustainability and the human sustainability, human resources sustainability, are also important. Uh, again, just changing, uh, abandoning the whole, the big sets and the big theaters and going to smaller things all of a sudden has an impact on certain theatrical professions, on all the workshops, on all the production of, of those big sets because they are not robots doing them. They are sets of people and certain professions. Again, we still have to, so every, I think everything will change. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know how ready everybody is, because in Romania at least, everybody's hanging from the doors of the big stone theaters. And they're still waiting for the state to pay the huge gas and electricity bills. Because we don't want to think about uh, changing the lights of projectors, because you know a LED projector doesn't go black with enough speed. <laughs> and things like that. And again, uh, yes, uh, uh, we in Romania, we have this, and the same in Hungary, uh, and all over the region, we have these very big stone theaters built in another time with halls that are too large for one department of yes, the current modes of production. Because already the, the, the production changed enough so that you, it's very difficult to find something, a product to do, do something for a thousand spectators at once. Yeah, but we are still, so we are moving with Cluj. This, is, this happens in the Hungarian theater, for instance, uh, because the hall is, is so big. We move the spectators on the stage. It's the same in the Hungarian in, in another, a, a lot of places in, in Romania. Yeah, but we are still hitting the whole, the whole thing. It's, it's very, it's actually very, very delicate, and I think it's a good moment to just put a foot in the door. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So, what about your foot in the door, John? What do you think about this? Um, absolutely. I mean. A few years ago, I, 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 I was envisioning the same thing for myself. Like, okay, no, this, this has to stop. At some point in the future, uh, state theaters, these rock theaters, they will have to uh, realize that, that you cannot do sets with 150,000 euro and then play that performance three times and then take it off the program because you can do uh, 150. Thousand divided by seventeen thousand. How many? How many affectionate projects can you do from just one set playing three times? Almost ten. Eh? So, so somehow uh, we have to be forced into finding new ways. And I was thinking, in the next 10, 20 years, this change has to happen. And. Of course, the things and the critical moment that we are in is not very nice, but in a certain sense, I am happy for, 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 for this, that maybe, as you, as you are saying, maybe it's 
just it's, the circumstances are just forcing us to do this. And then there are some questions which we cannot uh, escape from anymore. And it should be time to, to, to look in the mirror and start asking, uh, uh, answering these questions. The problem is, I think there is still and there will be a lack of communication between the, the upper levels and yeah. my foot. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I can try to keep the door, but I, I, I keep getting the, the impression that I am kicking a door which is actually a wall. And I, I went, to, you know, I went, and the porter said, "Oh yeah, there's the door." Go, yeah, go, that's that's go. what I wanted to say. That in Eastern Europe, first you have to find the right door. Exactly. So that's the first. Or put a foot in all the doors. Yeah. That's the door. <laughs> For this, you have to be a sort of a superman because in the previous panel we heard from the colleagues how difficult all of this is. So it's still a mystery to me, even though I think, yes, the time is maybe it's, it's good because of the circumstances. It's still a mystery to me whether we will be strong enough, have energy enough, or if we will have the critical mass. And for instance, we have this pilot project with 4 million, 4 million euros. Yes which is very nice, we have to spend it because otherwise we will not be able to do our highways. Uh, but, this is a pilot project. What is going to happen afterwards? This is my question. Is it going to, are the, the, the people who give the money, will they ever think about, oh, how nice, we should do a second, a third, a thirtieth, a fiftieth. You know, it depends on the results. That's, that's the thing with pilots, you know? Because you know, I have what what if it proves a, a huge burden to find enough local authorities interested in giving five euros. Because you know, it's it's something for the community. We cannot keep on enlightening communities by deciding from the above and from bureaucrats what they have to do within their own communities. That's the whole idea with the co local co-financing. Because they have to be willing to have this within their community. You know, if this pilot proves that there's not enough local authorities willing to do it, because there's, you know, it's European condition, has, you have a number there. It's not like we give you the money, and, uh, you know, and we are remaining so between <laughs> so then you go back, you know, and you go back and you devise, you, you the Apache the model, you devise a strategy in order to increase the interest either through, you know, the carrot or the stick for the local authorities, you know, because all the data, that's a pilot. It gives you data, it gives you information, and then you can go further. It's, you, you don't do the second one the same. You take the data from the first one and you adjust it so that it can work. And it can work, it, it can be done with the, the money in you know, the chain. You can, it can be done in many, many other ways. But you know, it's like jumping to the next level. Let's see what this this pro this program brings back as data. Because if it proves that the local communities don't want culture, then you have to go back and find a way to either convince them or force them or a <laughs> combination of both. Okay, guys. Chongo, are you a fire me if I don't start this conversation? And we don't oh, no, me, me, me. No, 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 he will fire me. No, I changed my mind. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, maybe it's a time when we can, we can ask Gobi, Gobi Bartolish, uh, um, if, if you have anything to add.
Doar că teatrul nostru, într-adevăr, a fost ultima, adică una dintre ultimele teatrile care a mai avut turne în sate. A avut un sistem de abonamente și duceam spectacolele noastre care le-am făcut în oraș, le-am transportat la sate. Am avut cam 5-6 sate, ori câte 3 spectacole pe an. Problema era ce s-a omit aici condițiile precare care le-am avut acolo. Trebuia să așteptăm seara vacile să ajungă acasă ca să putem să începem spectacole. Și toate astea poate nici n-ar fi fost așa o mare problemă, dar spectacolele prin concertul de spațiul pe care l-am avut noi în casa lui, la mine cu Raciu, aceste spectacole în spațiile astea mai mici s-au deteriorat foarte mult. Și din punct de vedere artistic am fost noi actori afectați pentru că n-am putut să, să ajungem la performanța cu care ne-am pregătit. Uh, însă am fost într-un fel compensați de reacția publicului care ne-a îndrăgit foarte mult și în spectacole uh, de obicei uh, ne-au uh, uh, ne dat de mâncare, de băut, uh, am fost uh, Uh, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, she doesn't have too much to add what, to what uh, what's being said here, uh, except that, uh, yes, uh, uh, the Chiki Attics in the theater of Premier Kuriachuk was one of the last to implement this system, even in the past few years, of, uh, of touring their, the productions that they made in the town, in their own big uh, space touring them to the villages surrounding uh, the, the, the town. Um, and uh, the, the, here, of course, they had to adapt to the conditions, so wait for the cows to come in so that the locals could, could finish their work and then they can go to the theater. Uh, also, another experience was their experience that, that shows that they made in their own space became artistically a little bit deteriorated because of the conditions that were different in the villages, but on the other hand, they received a lot of love from the locals, uh, who always offered them sandwiches and, and something to drink and would come to talk to them. This project has been completed in 2018. This project to go to the city was the idea și cred că devocamentul fostului nostru director Polat Comicloș, care a crescut foarte mult în misiunea culturală. Nu știu bine, deci eu am participat la acest proiect ca actor, așa din audite știu, parcă am avut un fel de compensare financiară din partea Consiliului Județean, care a plătit transporturile uh, uh, și uh, tot în acest zi, deci directorul nostru a plecat și după aceea s-a schimbat și conducerea uh, orașului, care este bine, dar conducerea uh, veche a orașului uh, a stabilit un preț enorm pentru spectacole și uh, uh, a stabilit că putem să ducem spectacole doar dacă aceste sate vor plăti prețul care era enorm, deci s-a oprit proiectul acesta, însă din partea primarilor din aceste sate, întotdeauna primim de atunci întrebarea cum putem să mergem încă o dată, deci este o, 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 o necesitate și este o dorință din, din partea acestor state și și casele de cultură au fost renoite din, din fundul europene deci sunt mult mai bune condițiile, așa că uh, ideea ar fi ca să intre în proiectul teatrului, să preluăm încă o dată în alte condiții, în alte dimensiuni, dar să ar trebui continuat acest, uh, acest proiect. Îmi pare foarte bine că am avut de aceste fonduri și vă, chiar vreau să transmit directorilor să, uh, să se folosească de aceste fonduri.
so this kind of practice it stopped in 2018 once the former director of their theater uh, left um, and also the, the, the town the people who were running the town changed and so the new the new system the new people the new mayor they were uh, asking for a much higher uh, price so they were saying that the, the, the local uh, the villages should pay for themselves completely, which then made it impossible for them to bring these productions uh, because they didn't have any more subsidy. Um, at the same time, the mayors are still telling them that, oh, we would like to have you back and, and so on. And, and Julia was uh, whispering to my, to my ear here, uh, yes, but are they willing to pay? <laughs> so, yes, exactly. There is a difference between, oh, we would like it so much, and between what am I willing to, to, to do. And just one other thing that Gabi mentioned, that in the meantime, these cultural houses uh, in, the, in the region became renovated, um, so now they would have better conditions if they would return to this kind of practice. And I think Claudio wanted to... three things, but very short. One, I don't think uh, we should talk about, we should speak about the willingness of paying a cultural service. It's about the capacity of the local authorities to cover these expenses. There are uh, villages, administrations, that they, they don't have money for their own employees. I know a few cases, I have relatives that work in the local administration, and I, I, I know from the direct source this situation. So, uh, they all rely, unfortunately, on the county council uh, mercy to get funds for different things from uh, uh, building up a, a street in, in, their, in, in their village up to cultural services and everything. Uh, about the touring, uh, a lot of uh, local theatres in Romania, mostly children theatres, as Julia mentioned, but also drama theatres, are touring in the region, near region, especially those ones that depend, that, that are subsidized by the uh, regional count, uh, councils, because the managers have their managing program, this uh, activity. Uh, of course, they don't tour, unfortunately, at the countryside. But in the small uh, cities, towns in, in, in that area, because usually uh, the infrastructure in the villages uh, area is very poor. So, as Gabi uh, Bartolis uh, mentioned, if, if you have a spectacle prepared in a professional theater in a certain infrastructure, it would be very difficult to play on a, I don't know, in a bar on the countryside. But there are theaters touring, so this is a model that could be improved and developed. And so. uh, the third thing is like a personal uh, observation. Last year I was one of the uh, curators of the National uh, Theatre Festival, which was held online only. And it was a really, really moving surprise. After the festival, uh, uh, the organizers, our friends from UNITER, that are the producers of this festival, sent us some emails uh, reached from the uh, spectators, from the audience all over the country, from villages, from small towns and cities and so on, uh, uh, thanking us for uh, uh, broadcasting online the festival so they could see productions that would be very difficult to attend in normal conditions. So, maybe these are some points we could create a frame and develop in different ways. I don't know. We should, we should speak about that. Yeah, but not this time. So thank you for sh sharing this last thing. I think it's, it's extremely important. And we had the same experience in Hungary, actually, with, uh, you know, the, uh, all these online streaming shows and so on and so on. So the accessibility in a country where there is practically no cultural mobility, 
upgrades to the add-ons. So and and uh, and you know uh, we we also have some data, some statistics saying that, uh, for example, from these online streaming uh, theater shows, like 60% of the spectators are from the countryside, from places uh, uh, that never get a theatrical, a high quality theatrical experience. So that means something, and maybe the decision makers one day realize that there is something to do with this. Okay, thank you very much for Claire Shania Popovic and Chombor Köller for being here today. Thank you for all your questions. Our guests are still available, but we have to stop this now because Chombor will present two books and we have a five minutes break, right? Yes, I propose. Um, I propose, is it okay if we meet at quarter to six? Yeah. Then I, and, then, and then I will make a 15 minute presentation and then coffee break. Thank you very much.
Upper still stands. If you feel you need the uh, translation, please feel free to, to take uh, things from there. And also the offer for the seats and the stickers also stands as well. Okay, um, the actual reason that this event is organized is because uh, Shoshin Theatre Association uh, was part of a, a European project, an Erasmus Plus funded uh, project, which is called RIOTE. This is an acronym which stands for Rural Inclusive Outdoor Theatre Education. This was the title of the project. What the project was about is uh, eight partners from different countries, eight organizations came together uh, and they exchanged workshops, so-called joint staff trainings, where you could, you could learn from the experiences of the other partners and each organization would host one such training in their own uh, country. Then the second thing was to make a performance with a, a, a group of locals in a village, so in a rural area, preferably outdoors. So our task was to find, and the task of each partner was to find a, a local community that they could work with, to deliver a series of workshops to this community, to the, to the participants that were willing to take part in this action, and then at the, at the end, to make a performance with them, with the part participants, so that the locals would be the actors in the performance. But what was important is that this performance was not going to be something already written. We were not going to put on a play. We were going to approach it from the key word, the myth. That's why this trend of the project was, uh, had the title, The Myth Behind uh, the Community. Um, and uh, then, based on these experiences, we, uh, the partners, uh, um, uh, did this output, which is a PDF, it's a digital book, which can be downloaded uh, from the website of the project, uh, which is riote.org but also from the websites of the participating organizations. So uh, Shoshin will put it on our own website. What you can see here now is the English version, but um, we also have a Romanian version and the Hungarian version. These are not online yet, uh, but they will get online uh, in what remains from this month of September. So by the end of the month, we should have uh, all, the, all the versions. So this output is The Myth Behind the Community, an anthology of theatrical experiences in rural areas. And as the subtitle suggests, we are uh, dealing with a collection of texts written by all the partners and divided into chapters, of which we have four. So we have participatory theater in rural areas, theater as a tool for inter intercultural dialogue, interpretation skills development and street theater techniques, and caravans as a main concept for rural touring and connecting uh, communities, plus an introduction and closing thoughts. Um, going to the introduction a little bit, starting off from what our colleague Marco Luciano from Teatro Nocleo wrote, I would like to read aloud the very first paragraph. You can also see it there, of course. Theater is based on citizenship. As Stefano Rodotta said, theater is the polis. In its main characteristics, it has the function of collecting the legacy of ritual, of celebration, of mythology, through which the community represents itself, narrates itself, and celebrates itself in its social dramas and ideals. Theater and educational processes meet in the relational, social, and communitarian dimension, where cognitive, emotional, and physical aspects are integrated, where we can recognize the multiple dimensions of the individual's development, and where knowledge is intertwined with feeling, creation, and aesthetics. 
So, um, as I said, uh, this, this output is largely based on the experiences of the partners um, through, the, through the specter of, of uh, the, the four chapters that we have. Um, when I talk about myth, it's not, for instance, one of the Hungarian partners, one of the partners from Hungary, Sinu, they work with their uh, local group, local community, on an actual myth, a mythological tale of uh, Janus Bifrontes. But, for instance, us in Mera, we worked on, on local myths, so myths of origin from Mera, local legends, intertwined with personal history of the participants, their personal memories and uh, themes that are important for them from their own uh, community, family and life. And you mentioned this in the, in the very first uh, panel. So, um, as Marco Luciano points out a little bit later in the introduction, the word myth should not be understood simply as mythology, epic, fantastic tale but rather in its purest meaning, that of war, tale, or discourse. The community that precisely narrates, questions and responds, generates the stories that ground and define its social system, expressing a precise phase in the historical development of human communication. They allow fears and beliefs, hopes, and socio-economic conditions to emerge in the form of symbols. Through narration, be it oral, musical, or physical, communities recognize and preserve themselves. So this output then details the different approaches taken by the partners uh, and gives uh, a sort of a collection of strategies. Each partner in their respective chapter details the way that they approached their own community. Uh, an input from Mark Helliar uh, from the UK, uh, detailing the work that they, they did in a small town uh, in Somerset, um, where they were doing it, what their aspirations were, what their artistic aspirations were, what were the expectations of the community uh, itself, um, how they did it, uh, what was planned and what was the difference between what was initially planned and the way it played out. So, uh, as he has here, what worked well and what worked less well. Um, and then we have uh, Shoshin's experiences in rural areas doing participatory theater. So again, detailing the way that we would approach a local community and detailing uh, the, uh, the idea and concept of uh, the partner, which is uh, a cultural exchange between locals and the artists that visit them. So in the idea of the partner, it's not just that the locals are watching the show, it's they are taking part in it with input from their own culture, which can be a song, a poem, a tale, or just uh, some kind of work with the hand, a showing a profession, or showing a tractor or a cow as part of your local culture. So we try to detail this as well as the work that we did last year in uh, Mera, how we were how we were working towards reaching a group cohesion in a group where we had the oldest participant was 77 and the youngest was four. So uh, how how to bridge this? How to arrive? how to try and arrive in a situation where there is no hierarchy between the oldest and the, the, the smallest one in age. A situation where, you can, where horizontal structures can play out, where there is equality and everybody from the smallest little girl to the most elderly can have the freedom to, to express themselves and, and put their input into what they are doing together. Um, so this is basically detailing uh, our experience. Then in the second chapter, um, our partners from Slovenia and from France, they go more into intercultural aspects. So a lot of their work is dealing with, for instance in France, uh, working with immigrants and local community. 
So how to make a theater project where where you take where you take immigrants and you take the local people and try to find again the bridge between them, uh, how to connect them. Uh, again, you can you have a lot of descriptions, um, a lot of ideas, a lot of tactics, concrete strategies, concrete exercises employed. Um, for instance, table theater is a practice run by Kudlyud, uh, our Slovenian partner, um, which is that you take a table, you, you go to a certain community and you make interviews with them about the problems of their community. It can be people who are living in one apartment block. For instance, what problems do they face in their normal interactions and life uh, in that place? And then you take these interviews, you devise a very simple interaction, theater, but not so, not so complicated, not so complex. And you invite these people, but usually it, it would be five or ten people. It can be 40, it can be 50. But it works best with, for instance, 10 people. And they sit around the table, they watch the, the play, the drama that plays out, which was built on the interviews made with them. And then they enter into a discussion about what they saw, about how they uh, understand all this, and what their input would be, and so on. So this is a very uh, uh, small scale thing, but extremely powerful, uh, 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 precisely because it works with not so many people, so the effect can be much stronger. Um, this is the, the partners in France I already uh, mentioned. And then in this uh, third chapter, there are, uh, the, the focus is more on street, street theater, so we have the input from our Hungarian partner, the German uh, partner. We have also, again, uh, a lot of, uh, especially in the, in the German uh, uh, part, a lot of uh, exercises, concrete exercises that describe and that can be taken and used. And then in the fourth chapter, as I said, is this idea of the caravan, as we discussed in, in, the, in the previous panel. It, you take one performance to one place, but it works the best if you take one performance to different, uh, different places. So this book is sort of a, I think, a practical guide, a hands-on guide, which can be helpful to students or artists or people who, who would like to work uh, in, the, in, in the field of uh, engaging communities uh, in cultural practice. Um, as I said, for now it's a digital book, so it's a, it's a PDF, uh, but uh, we do have plans to, to print the Romanian and the Hungarian versions. For now, please feel free to download it, and please feel free to, to share it with anyone who you know that it could be helpful to them. Okay, um, and then just very briefly about the other input, uh, the other output, sorry. Uh, my input about the output uh, is, this is about, so within this project we received some, some things that would measure what is called HRV, heart rate variability, which is the little, very little difference in time between two heartbeats. Normally we do not sense that there is a difference, but there is a little fluctuation. This is a relatively new thing in science, and from these fluctuations in your heart rate variability, they can give you a lot of uh, clues about uh, how stressed you are, about uh, how fit you are, about uh, um, how well you rest, and so on. So, for instance, I'm just going to cut to, to one. So this is, and we had the opportunity to test this. Um, and then you have this uh, nice chart. So here we were all uh, writing a little journal, what we are doing, family life, 45 minutes, eating, 60 minutes, so on. And then 
from the measurements, we can see our uh, stress levels. So for the, the red is not, the red is stress. So we can see here that the person who was wearing this had a very, very stressful day in which, in, in which he had just very, very short moments of, uh, of uh, not stress, of, of uh, recovery. Um, and then a lot of, a lot of uh, stressful uh, uh, experiences. And this was the most, 15 minutes with the strongest stress reactions. And if you can see here, this is a meeting which lasted, which lasted 15 minutes. <laughs> so um, we, we tried this on and it was, it is just, then you, you look at it and you're like, oh no, God. Um, um, we also tried these uh, with the participants that we worked with. And there was another um, gadget, which is called the Polar. And this one doesn't measure just the individual, but it can measure, measure the collective. So we put it on all the actors that participated. But also during the performance where we had audience, we put it also on members of the audience. And then this allows you, and I will just show you the, a few charts. This is for instance, uh, this is too complicated. Too. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so this, for instance, this line is the workshop leader. You can see that at the, at the, at the whole time he was relatively stable. So the situation was he was giving instructions to the participants, but he was not engaged in it himself, physically. He was just watching, which allowed him to be relatively stable. And you can see the participants' uh, heart rate changing while they were doing the exercises. So uh, you can see that kind of like the same thing is happening to uh, most of the people at the same time. Of course, this is connected here. Probably there was an exercise which involved more uh, physical activity. But uh, uh, at the same time, it allows for uh, synchronicity in the, in the team to develop. And then, uh, Nicolette, Nicolette, okay. And here is another trainer. Uh, she was doing the exercises together with the party. Or maybe he, I don't know. He or she, you can see the name. He or she was doing the... the and Iker was doing the exercises together with the participants, so you can see, as opposed to the previous example, uh, uh, she is also fluctuating together with the group, and a little bit above it. <laughs> so, uh, I am not an expert of these charts, um, uh, but our colleague from, uh, from Utsasak, which is a, one of the Hungarian organizations present in this uh, project, he was the one who led this part of the, of the project, this uh, research, and he was the one who wrote this output, the ninth sense. This is also being finished and translated, so hopefully we will have it by the end of the month. And this also can offer uh, insight into what exactly is happening in physiological terms in the individual and in groups in the act of theatre which can also be helpful, I think, for artists and, and of course, professionals from other fields as well uh, who are interested in this. Okay, this is the end of my part. Thank you very much for, for, for being here. And, and please download the books. <laughs>
me uh, sort of a highlight. Um, I introduce you Sue Gill and John Fox from uh, Then Good Guides and uh, formerly uh, Welfare State International. I am very happy, I mean, the, in the name of the whole team, I can say that we are very happy and thankful that you accepted our invitation and that you came here and that you will uh, give this little talk about your, your activity. And also there is a short film and I think some surprises as well uh, from New York. All the, all the, all the birds will start falling down the um, uh, Just from an organizational perspective, I would like to kindly ask you at the end, if you still haven't uh, uh, completed this uh, participants list, my colleague Julia uh, will come around and try to ask people, have you completed it? Um, she will try to do this. Uh, if you haven't completed, please try to, to, to be helpful with her. Also, I repeat our invitation uh, to take these gifts, and I would like to give the word to Well, hello, thank you. Um, just to say before we start, we'd like to give some thanks because we've been beautifully, wonderfully treated here by a lot of people. Chongo, Colo, Polly, and Eunice, and about 12 volunteers who have been working their socks off all the time to help us. And I'm not going to read out all the names because I won't remember them, but there are a lot of volunteers, a massive amount of help from, from the people here. We started off this morning with a little workshop, and this is the, the, the collapsing bird syndrome. We also produced a piece of epic theater. It was a unique uh, production, uh, certainly a world premiere, uh, of the relationship between a vacuum cleaner a hen and a knife and fork. Truly epic. Those of you who are here who have said it was epic, we have one absolute <laughs> dream. There we go. So, um, over to you. And we also had a song. Uh, we learnt it in about four minutes this morning. <laughs> the words are, because we're going to sing it two or three times, it's a very short song, and if you felt comfortable, you are welcome to jump. Oh, hello, you're so <laughs> So, the words are, my poor bird, take thy flight high above the sorrows of this dark.
we've got a tour it. We're, we're putting it for a big round show. We take it to a We've done 100 shows for our remaining with that uh, Just to say that the words, the words that have been coming up today, uh, over and over again, are community, participation, connection, dialogue, stories, and then authority and money. We're going to talk about everything except authority and money. Okay. In 1968, way before half of you were even born, we started creating our first street theatre and our manifesto read, we're making an entertainment, an alternative, and a way of life. In 2022, 54 years later, our aims are surprisingly similar, although a way of life is taking priority. It's a journey of many endings and new beginnings. John Fox and I started Welfare State International, known as WSI, with others in 1968. The company achieved a worldwide reputation for creating site-specific theater, fire shows, lantern parades, installations, and participatory art. We archived WSI in 2006, long story, and started Dead Good Guides, our new smaller company. Whilst we will reference a little of our own events, we will concentrate mainly on our work with communities in and around Ulverston in Cumbria, that's the Lake District, northwest England. Just to say, I'm not sure the trigger's working. Is it, should it be working now or is it coming on later? Well, yeah. No, I know, but there was a couple of sweats. But... Okay. I'll go to it. I'll, I'll stop reading next week. We're going to show you a film in a moment, uh, which was about our last show. It was called Long Line, the Carnival Opera. Now, this show lasted three hours and it was performed four times in a circus tent in snow in March 2006. It was prepared and researched over three years, building trust and skills, as you all know, within a community network, takes time and patience, and multi-skilled artists who listen and who are happy to work with different generations. Over three, hang on, over three years, we researched the history and ecology of Morecambe Bay, talked to many people, produced exhibitions, a song cycle, a preview theatre piece in a cockpit arena in Lantern House, which is a building we got with a lottery funding, which we'll show you at the end. And we developed a whole young people's theatre ensemble, and we published a photograph text book of Bay characters and their stories. So here is the film. <laughs> snakes and ladders and all the ladders have gone away. The snow was unexpected. When uh, was, we suggested we were doing a gig in March, people said, oh, you know, it'd be too cold. I thought, oh, it'd be fine. You can heat a surface tent, but you'll never get any snow around here in March if you get the first snow from 30 years around here. There's been a few problems. Yeah. First, the generator went, so we lost all electric in the tent. And it was snowed all the games, so we had no one to keep the cars to. But that's fine, because, um, 
we have the most spice, but we, we're trying to kind of help out as much as we can, do a lot of rigging and, well, try not to get that mucky, but, we're, you know, it's not working. Basically, we'll we've got musicians in there who are playing this way to the crowd feet, yeah. but in the meantime, you, will, you put that side back and sit there. Okay. You would? Yeah. Okay. So. And um, we need to prepare for that, and then we're going to do a run through of the show, and then the show will come tomorrow night. Pity we're going to put it that sign. I'm going to close it up again. So we can open the whole sign. You with me? Yeah. yeah. And I'll just put a bit of an overlap on I'll do a drawing for a brief. And it went on and on like that. We then had a quagmire on site, so we had to do have a ton of gravel delivered in order to stop the flooding. Then we had to build uh, drains and we had to put pumps in and so on. <laughs> That's well first day, boy. Yeah. Well first day. We need to, um, I think it was fine you doing the mass, but we were very full, very like you know. Um, a bit of a priest, you know, you're doing really. Alright, so if you then crouch down, okay, and, and Ruben is ready behind his puppet to come forward. So now let's try getting the. Now, can we get the. Um, I was looking for the dragon's code at this point. We're an artist on the new script. We were 13 on the old script. Why don't we go. Um, the Alamia, five part Alamia. Childhood was dead for a <laughs> when the sea swells. Well, yeah, they are going to the sea by the anyway. And then I'll go over the choir singing, when the sea swells. Oh, are, are you saying you do want my coach? Yes. Well, no, what I'm asking is, are you going to put the film on? No, I think that's going to be confusing. Keep it clear. Okay. Keep it clear. Okay. Right, so we then go to the Calypso uh, and yeah. uh, bring it down to the gallery. So yeah, do that a bit of, I was going to write a poem or a speech as well. And again, some kind of sense of how long that lasts. Because well, that's my idea. We'll just go round and round and round. Do, 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 do. We'll have to time that with the action. Yeah. I just need to know, yeah. The running order of the show is here. Right, please take it into consideration. I will cue you in plenty of time. Tomorrow, I think for our own state of mind, I think it would be really, really good if you guys could make it here for 6.15. Tomorrow is the opening night. If you could make it here for 6.15 tomorrow night, that would be brilliant to go through some of the bits we have to done. I will see you tomorrow. Clear the space quietly. Thank you.
schools come off the stage, I was sitting next to a small girl, she was about three years old, and she burst into spontaneous applause, which made me cry. Um, it was a very moving performance, the whole thing. Well done, well first day. about a way of um, connecting people through their, their hands and their hearts and their, and their needs in, in a way that uh, uh, is really important to maintain. Because I think a lot of what we live in is a, is a, a kind of fake, well, it's a fake democracy, but it's also a fake um, reality. People are persuaded that things are real. And when you actually examine them, they're, they're, they're fantasy, they're mad, they're building trap and siblings, or, or um, the hypocrisy of an arms dealer that you get where. You know, the, the story goes from our prime minister that if we don't sell arms, somebody else will. But, uh, but it's, it's wicked and immoral. <laughs> state of uh, extreme apathy and fear by manipulation through, um, say, terrorism or through mortgages or through propaganda, um, so that they're not able to be free to connect with their neighbours, to make things in a more home neighbourhood.
The only way we got through the difficulties, which were enormous, was by a sense of everybody holding onto this mess. You know, like 200 people hanging onto it. And there was a big egg in there. If we got it wrong, if we threw it in the air or it fell off the edge, it would be a total disaster. So by all those people focusing and concentrating with great uh, dedication, commitment and, and, and generosity, they kept the egg fine, it didn't fall off the egg. And I think that's a kind of political statement. It's perfectly possible to do it, and it doesn't happen often enough uh, because people are, are divided and ruled by uh, fear and greed. find a drug in, the, in a man-made 
do. is an old market town, population 14,000, located on the western edge of Morecambe Bay. The town used to depend on fishing for shellfish, farming and water-powered mills, but in the 20th century it changed to chemical and high-tech industries, many linked to armaments, nuclear power and trident submarines, the main source of employment now nine miles away from Cairo and Furnace. In 1978, we stopped our nomadic existence, touring with our circus tent and convoy of ten caravans, and our family settled in a house in Overston. The town was in decline with 44 empty shops and a miserable atmosphere. Now it is vibrant, a trendy place to live, proclaiming itself the festival's town. Over recent decades, we and the arts have played a big part in its cultural revival. Our clowning outdoor events, such as dancing traffic cones, would deride multiple ever-changing roadworks. We started flag fortnights with locally designed handmade silk flags to fly above shop fronts for two weeks in May. New flags are still made year by year. Walking along the cobbled street, it is like walking inside a Matisse painting. Family flags were popular, far up popular, flying above people's homes. Designed by school children, they celebrate the work of their parents. I'm proud my dad is a firefighter, and I'm proud that my mum is an ambulance driver. <coughs> Comic Street Theatre devised and rehearsed in public workshops frequently with novice performers, as included wheelbarrow formation dancing, inspired by vegetable shows, traditional and still popular in the local culture. Participants become giant carrots and parsnips. Our early role in the 1980s was to initiate events, support, and hand over to the community 
to volunteers when he felt the right time, then stepped back. Sue and I both played saxophones in Blast Furness, the Furness being the name of the location as opposed to Blast Furness, the name of a, of a, a steel um, uh, kiln. A street band that has been going for 20 years, which always gets a gig at local festivals and shows. WSI was invited to an international theatre festival in 1982, way up in the north of Japan, where we made a version of King Lear on a mountainside. We were lucky enough to experience an extraordinary Shinto lantern parade as we travelled after the festival. Returning to, Lund to Ulverston, we invented and started Ulverston's lantern parade a year later. We experimented with willow sticks to make frameworks, wet strength tissue paper glued over, and lit by candles inside. This worked perfectly. From small beginnings, this festival has grown and spread worldwide. In August and every September, we close the streets to traffic for one night, as four parades, four rivers of light, led by four bands, flow from all quarters of the town. The theme is different every year. Hundreds of lanterns are constructed and thousands of residents and many visitors congregate for an annual moment of belonging and excess. It's only in aid of itself, entirely voluntary, homemade, although with the inherent skill of local engineers in the family, multi-generational and a seasonal autumnal rite of passage to celebrate family and friends and belonging before the dark days of winter, a classic model of community art. Now, I digress now. At, at this time in the UK, this actual week, actually today, no, this actual week, sorry, thousands of events are being cancelled, sports events, cultural events, in line with the death of the Queen. The Lantern parade team in Ulverston agonised over what to do and decided to go ahead, not to cancel, as this moment brings people together and will offer a focus and a moment to be together. A local artist has been commissioned to make a unique lantern in the shape of a royal crown which will lead one of the parades. So at this actual time tonight, families will be coming out of their front doors with their children, with their lanterns, to go to their start points. The bands will be warming up that bus first band. So, for the last 34 years, John and I have never missed it. So tonight, because we wanted to be here, we are missing it at the year 35. So, top of a nearby hill, a monumental lighthouse looms over Ulverston. It is a memorial to Sir John Barrow, an 18th century imperialist Lord of the Admiralty, who was born here. An important principle of community art is to use local themes, so the lighthouse turns up in various guises. <laughs> Probably Sir John Barrow saying he can't be having these, this nonsense at all, so he's going to recruit imperialist soldiers and stop them. <laughs> so, um, an important principle of community arts is to make sure your birds don't fall over. And um, especially, of course, when you're marking something like the Millennium 2000. Now, community art, or quote, socially engaged art in the current jargon, should be strong original, poetic, surprising, engaging, and necessary, not surrogate social work or sentimental jingoistic reinforcements. For the millennium, we had to be very wary of being used for the wrong political reasons, but at least we persuaded hundreds of people to walk up Lighthouse Hill, 
some for the first time in their lives, to see the longest flag in the world and experience our local skilled mountain climbers costumed as six St. John Barriers, abseiling on ropes from the top of the monument. Once upon a time, WSI toured to many countries with many shows. We lived collectively, mostly pair bonded, in a mobile village of caravans. In the 1970s, we thought more theatre troops would follow, but few did. In working and living together, we discovered occasional ceremonies to mark milestones in our lives. Some of this legacy has since become mainstream and we'll return to that topic a little later. We educated all the company's young children ourselves on the road in a whirlwind of creative discovery, hands-on learning, practical art making, and working to earn a living. It was successful. These young people, well, some of them are in their 50s already, are now out in the professional world as artists, musicians, a legal aid lawyer, an environmental project leader, an animator, fashion designer, and a TV production manager. Our big spectacles, such as theatrically setting fire to a replica of the Houses of Parliament for an audience of 12,000, were challenging. So was raising the Titanic in an international London Theatre Festival. For 10 days each evening on a dockside in Limehouse in a three hour carnival performance for a 300 seated audience, we demonstrated political links between the class ridden disaster of the Titanic, Margaret Thatcher's capitalism, the Falklands War, and the gentrification of the very dockside we were working on with its expensive new apartments where local people were now excluded and where as we were working and living in our tents. Such powerful... Yeah. Yeah. Let's just say a little bit about these slides. This is from the we used containers, which is one of the reasons the dock was changing from the old shipping harbour. And uh, we used the containers to use them like a doll's house and slice through. So the image you see here is of the, the stokers underneath lighting the fires and the rich people up, up above having a fancy dress party. The ice giants the iceberg intrudes. And there's a question at the end of essentially the children, why did you allow the Titanic to sink? The Titanic, of course, being in our case, an allegory for the political situation that we were in. So there was a challenging um, question. And then the sharks on the dock side come looming up at the end of the particular um, event. So, such powerful site-specific theatre received very good view, reviews, and we had a reputation, and we were getting grants. But, but, we travelled, we camped, created something new, and performed, then we left. Memories and rumours were established and enjoyed, but what remained? Radical as they were, these shows were still products entertainment to be enjoyed and consumed. We were looking for something more satisfying, more long-term and sustainable for ourselves and for the communities we connected with. So we abandoned the urbanism and settled in Ulverston. In 1983, we also began a seven-year residency in Barrow in Furness, where the town fills our nation's nuclear submarines. A huge challenge for our anti-war politics. In all the years, we never accepted funding from some the multi-billion pound company BAE Systems, but we did constantly connect with the individuals who make up the workforce in the shipyard 
as it is always referred to. So in 1983, Barrow had strong amateur theatre and music societies taking classic well-known plays, light operas and musicals off the shelf, but no contemporary arts policy and no locally created new original work. We started the ball rolling with a punk film casting performers from the community. Am I in the wrong place? No, you're in the wrong place. We started the ball rolling with a punk film casting performers from the community based on Shakespeare's King Lear and written by radical poet Adrian Mitchell. He reversed the name from King Lear to King Real. King Real and the Hoodlums was a Mad Max provocation which kept a lot of adolescents off the streets because we started s serving breakfast on site at 8 o'clock in the morning to get them, the cows to turn up and their mothers just sent them out to the front. <laughs> so I'll feed you, go down here, off the streets. And, it's, and it starred a mad king in a nuclear submarine. It caused a furor. So, to placate critics, in 1987, we decided to design an in an ingratiating sonnet lumiere to mark the centennial of Barrow Town Hall, featuring Queen Victoria. There she is on the poster. She'd been invited, but she failed to attend in 1887, so we thought it was time she should visit on her elephant gun carriage. So that's the town hall. This parade is of the refuse collectors who turned out on the Sunday and had decorated their refuse carts. We had to give a few lots of pound notes to get them there, but they came. Oh, yes. This is Queen Victoria, you see, on the top of her gun carriage, her, her elephant gun carriage. And that's a pair of the boobies flying on the back of the, of, of the carriage. Right. Um, that's the B because the coat of arms of the barrow is a B and an arrow. Oh, yes. Very simple. We call this event a Tattoo Day, and we threw at it production values the like of which no one in Barrow had ever seen before, including a huge daylight pyrotechnic display from the top of the town. Oh, and there's the Nickers flying. Okay, it's you. A number of our key artists chose to live in Barrow. This commitment was crucial and helped us to initiate a choir, theatre workshops, writing workshops, a carnival parade band, cabaret evenings in pubs and poetry performances. The work rose to a climax in 1990 with a tapestry of shipyard tales presented over 10 days, mainly in the Civic Theatre with the proscenium stage, because that's the council that built and wanted us to use. And it was in the theatre that that theatre piece we did a number of, sorry, in that theatre we did a number of pieces, but some pieces were outside. The tapestry contained 11 original theatre shows, 10 entirely devised and performed by local people. And genres included sitcoms, a Brexit documentary, a children's opera, <coughs> The Shadow Factory, a song cycle about working in a wire factory, a street play with mummers, a full-scale pantomime, and Lord Dynamite. It was tricky to say it too critical and too obviously critical of BAE systems, so we did it through Lord Alfred Nobel, Lord Dynamite as we called him, because he kept saying the biggest stick of dynamite will be will stop the war, and of course he made his fortune in, with dynamite and then tried to buy his way out with the peace prize. So it, it was appropriate to treat uh, Lord Dynamite, Alfred Nobel, as a symbolic um, character in the, in the context. A, a recurring feature also featured a greedy cuckoo who was invading the nests of innocent birds, while a mad scientist built a wall to stop the cuckoo leaving, claiming this will keep the summer in forever. Our leaving gift was the golden submarine, a once-off extravaganza performed once on a rainy evening in the grounds of an ancient abbey for 3,000 spectators. After a carnival overture of dancers costumed as the streets of terrace houses, 
On came fantasy cars hurtling around the arena, which had been made into, and driven by shipyard welders who had taken their annual holidays so they could be bored. Next, here you see Lord Shelvet, the motorized capitalist ogre with detachable blood-stained hands, instructs a tower of aristocrats to, build, to launch a submarine. Too drunk to aim straight, they miss the submarine and launch the huge submarine sheds instead, which move aside to reveal a monstrous cuckoo inside, maintaining the eternal summer and the golden fleece for Barrow based on armament deals. Chaos ensues until a posse of female cleaners with a giant vacuum cleaner built on a car overcome Lord Shelvent and bring and bring the show to an end with the unique covering of the three pink. Okay, there's well, he's missing. There was a slide there of the um, the cleaners from the factory with massive three pin floats dancing across with electric wires showing behind them, doing their own invention of a crazy Danny Mumming dance, a victory dance over Lord Shelvin. Now you've seen the film, I just mentioned it again because I hadn't mentioned that it was made by Wojan Tursky. You can get it on um, on YouTube, you can also find it, our, our own website has been somewhat refurbished, but if you look on the, the media page, you can you can find the film there. Oh, yeah, sorry. In 1990, we left Barrow, leaving their art scene to grow with its own coterie of performers, poets, musicians, a carnival band, and a young theatre company. Since then, filmmakers, sound artists, community art workshops, and a gallery have been established, and the town has an arts programme. Our main focus became Overston again. Here, we helped maintain the momentum of the festivals we had started, particularly with the complex lantern parades. And in 1997, we were awarded a 1.6 million of National Arts Lottery money to refurbish the old school we had bought cheaply a few years before. We transformed it into Lantern House, the National Centre for Celebratory Arts, opening in 1999 with accommodation for artists, many performances and exhibition spaces, with a programme of summer schools to train musicians, choir leaders and secular ceremonies. 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 This lottery award extended the life of Welcome State uh, for nearly a decade. Um, and this is the Morecambe Bay site where we told you the story of Longline and the films we made, which was the last performance show we did there before we archived the company in 20, 2006. So we said we'd return to uh, the Rites of Passage thing briefly. We'll approach at the end, and I think we might be coming in on time. And then after the break, we'll be moving on from now. I can sense it, you know, obviously. Devising new ceremonies for secular rites of passage, as in, there are many people we meet who are not <coughs> members of any organised church, but still have a need for a spiritual life and wish to mark milestones in their lives with dignity, with meaning, and in a distinctive way. So we mentioned earlier when we were on the road, it was appropriate on occasion to mark certain personal milestones, such as naming the babies as they came along, betrothals, significant birthdays, or funerals. Such events, which we initially kept under the radar, they were never part of our public programme, gradually became more regular and we found ourselves facilitating ceremonies with and for a wider public. Oh, thank you. Good. Um, we, so we had an exhibition and we commissioned artists. There is no one in that coffin. It's a cardboard coffin from Switzerland. And we commissioned Caroline Menish to paint it for a lover of the sea. And to demonstrate you don't have to hire that expensive black purse. You can put it in the back of your own, your own car. And this is very interesting. This, a woman with her own diagnosis of her terminal illness came to see us. She had read the funerals book that we, that we wrote and she wanted to think about something distinctive for her own funeral. She was the, the captain of the ladies golf team in her village and also as she had a particular view that she loved
wonderful every night as she drove home from work. Go on. Go on. Oh, oh we haven't got it, that one. And so that coffin was painted by another artist, and as it was carried into the village church, nobody had seen it before, but they knew this woman, she was very popular. There was applause in the church, but she got it in one. That said everything about a tribute to her life. We've also had um, uh, oh, that's, a wish oh, that's a child's coffin, um, very small. This is Wishbone House. Uh, we got a commission, um, and this was de designed by Duncan Copley, and uh, constructed a ceremony space. So in that space, we've held baby names. Questions we've been asking really about the uh, the nature, the notion of community theatre, and I, 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 I believe we feel it should be extended to a much wider remit altogether. It's really about a cultural agenda, and that becomes, in the end, probably quite political. It raises the question all the time about whose culture is it, and who are the dominant gatekeepers. We believe it is essential to consider these questions to examine fundamental needs and, if necessary, create radical shifts in our given and or received order. This is important work. To use an old-fashioned concept, it is revolution. So let's get on with it. Good luck. To you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 